local restaurants, which could produce food sold under a variety of eatery names differing from the name displayed outside of their brick and mortar storefront and promote themselves exclusively on third party delivery platforms. The second, ghost kitchens. Model operates like a commissionary kitchen, a shared kitchen space. Restaurants can rent online ordering, pick up, and delivery only purposes. As storefront restaurants may have difficult producing food for both dine in customers and food delivery, renting space in a ghost kitchen facility can help restaurants free up space and time in their brick and mortar locations. While the rise of ghost kitchen companies may seem like a win for consumers and restaurants, I have a number of questions and concerns that I hope to discuss today. As the delivery industry will continue to increase efficiency and cut costs, third-party delivery platforms may open up their own ghost kitchen facilities. For example, DoorDash has already accomplished this in California and has used its pre-existing consumer data to approach restaurants that its users have requested, filling a cuisine gap in an area that may not currently have a particular type of food in that delivery radius. Because every food order at a ghost kitchen is at a digital transaction, ghost kitchens may also have access to a large amount of customer data. To further vertically integrate some ghost kitchens have begun opening up their own restaurants. Ghost Kitchen Facility, for example, like Cloud Kitchens, has used data to develop its own in-house restaurant brands. This allows the Ghost Kitchen Company to cut out the restaurant, an existing client, filling kitchen spaces with their own restaurants with cuisines that they know will succeed based on their data. Since ghost kitchens mainly partner with restaurant chains or well-known brands, they typically do not collaborate with our local small businesses. According to the investment firm Kitchen Fund, a brick and mortar restaurant will need to be making at least $1 million in delivery sales to break even in a ghost kitchen. Mom and pop shops seem to have no chance to participate in this rising sector of the food economy. The concern is that because of re restaurant brands save costs in ghost kitchens by employing fewer workers and renting less expensive commercial spaces, they could decrease their menu prices, producing food for delivery at below market rates. If this occurs, our mom and pop shops will be squeezed even further than they already are and could force some out of business in a market where 80% of our restaurants never make it to year five. High-end restaurants that offer more memorable experiences will be insulated from any harm, but your local trattoria, curry shop, burger bar, sushi place cannot compete with cheaper menu items delivered to customers at record speeds. With mom and pop shops going out of business, vacancy rates will increase, further undermining the character and charm of our city neighborhood's commercial corridors, something that we already see happening. Brick and mortar restaurants also serve as a gathering place for city residents. They offer a space for people of different backgrounds to come together in a social setting. Our local restaurants provide city residents internet access, a warm cup of coffee between shifts at a job, and a meeting point for parents and their children. Chain restaurants moving away from brick and mortar locations and opening up of ghost kitchen locations may therefore further erode opportunities for community engagement. While I have a number of other concerns that I hope to further discuss today, including issues related to ghost kitchens, transparency, and how ghost kitchens may seek to undermine grocery stores which are already struggling to compete with mega supermarkets. I want to make something clear. I support entrepreneurship and innovation and want New York City to be a partner for businesses, not undermine them. If ghost kitchens are planning on proliferating in New York, 
I hope they can support our strong communities and be a partner to our mom and pop stores and help build our neighborhoods. These hearings are important as we learn from stakeholders so we can better understand this marketplace and industry. With that said, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, our Legislative Counsel, Stephanie Jones, Attorney Christopher Geralds from the Office of Strategic Initiatives, and our Policy Analyst, Noah Mexler, for all their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I also want to recognize we have with us Councilmember Perkins and Rosenthal. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Greg Bishop, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I am joined by my colleague, Stephen Picker, the Executive Director of SBS's Food Service Industry Partnership, and Corrine Schiff, the Deputy Commissioner of Environmental Health with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. New York City is home to around 27,000 restaurants, and they employ over 270,000 New Yorkers. To assist restaurant owners, SBS offers many resources that help them start, operate, and grow. Our services to support restaurants include our government navigation and compliance advisory services, which help restaurants owners navigate the regulatory process and ensure that they are in compliance with the regulations necessary to maintain public health and safety. To date, compliance advisors have co provided more than 3,000 on-site consultations for restaurants, helping these businesses avoid common violations before their inspections and saving them more than $83 million in potential fines. We also help restaurant owners access capital, hire new employees, and fund employee training through our NYC Business Solutions Centers. Annually, SBS helps open roughly 500 restaurants, fill nearly 3,000 open positions at restaurants, and connect about 100 restaurants to around $4 million in, in financing. SBS is committed to helping neighborhood businesses thrive in their communities. SBS provides eligible business owners with legal services on topics including lease negotiations, formalizing oral lease agreements, and landlord harassment through our commercial lease assistance program. Of the more than 500 businesses served through the program, more than 25% are accommodation and food service establishments. To help neighborhood businesses adapt to changing market, market conditions, SBS runs the Love Your Local Grant Program. To date, we have provided technical assistance and over $2 million in grant funding to 41 small businesses, including 29 restaurants. Through Love Your Local, SBS aims to identify common challenges that are impacting the profitability of small businesses so that we can help and test new business services to support the growth and retention of longstanding businesses across the five boroughs. SBS is committed to working directly with the restaurant industry to understand their most pressing challenges. Our, food, our NYC Food and Beverage Industry Partnership is made up of over 30 New York City restaurant industry leaders, key professional associations, and community-based organizations that focus on skills training. This partnership allows us to work directly with the industry on priority issues impacting both employers and workers to support the growth of the sector. Key priorities include helping restaurants navigate the regulatory environment, addressing the demand for skilled workers, and providing support to adapt to the rising cost of doing business in the city. Of the major challenges elevated by the industry, members of the partnership cited the recruitment of skilled employees as one of the most important. This year, SBS launched First Course NYC, an apprenticeship program that teaches the culinary skills necessary for a career as a line cook, a position that is highly in demand in New York City's restaurant industry. Technology continues to impact many industries across New York City. Ghost kitchens capitalize on the popularity of food delivery applications and are, re, uh, and are a relatively new feature of the restaurant industry landscape. Ghost kitchens, which have also been called virtual kitchens, delivery kitchens, or cloud kitchens, are commercial food preparation and kitchen facilities designed to produce mm -hmm. delivery-only meals for custom consumers. While they share many characteristics with other food service models, such as food halls, 
fast casual businesses and incubator kitchens, ghost kitchens pose potential opportunities and challenges for small storefront restaurants. For a business that makes the bulk of its profits through delivery, ghost kitchens could provide opportunities for business owners to reach the delivery market without the overhead of operating a full service restaurant. However, as you indicated, uh, it may be challenging for neighborhood restaurants already struggling to utilize technology and reach the delivery market to compete with businesses operating out of ghost kitchens. The landscape of the restaurant industry is continually evolving and we aim to help business owners be nimble in adapting to changing market conditions. SBS is committed to working with our agency partners and the industry to better understand the opportunities, the challenges, and the impacts of ghost kitchens to better inform our small business owners. This is a new issue, and we look forward to continuing to engage with the City Council and to learn from our industry stakeholders. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is the Department of Health going to make an opening statement? Happy to take your questions. Great. So I want to thank both of you for being here on this very important hearing as we better understand um, this environment and marketplace of ghost kitchens, virtual kitchens. You've um, eloquently indicated that we have 27,000 restaurants in New York City that employ over 270,000 New Yorkers offering a service that is vital to this city, to our residents, our visitors, um, and our concern is the model that currently exists and the impact that technology is going to have, and in particular, not only food order apps, but in this regard, ghost kitchens. Some of my questions are directed directly to the Department of Health. Can you explain to us the current grading system for our local restaurants? and food establishments? Sure. Um, all restaurants that uh, serve the general public are, are in our grading program. We launched restaurant grading about 10 years ago. It's been- And I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself? Sure, by name yes. name and title. Uh, Corinne Schiff, I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health at the City Health Department. Uh, and I oversee our food safety program. Uh, so I, I can take specific questions about the restaurant grading program. Um, we launched t 10 years ago. Restaurants that serve the public uh, are in the grading program. We have found it to be extremely popular among New Yorkers and really effective in improving food safety practices among restaurants. I will put in a plug that just at uh, the very end of last year in December 2019, we relaunched our popular ABC Eats website, um, which lets New Yorkers look up uh, inspection history and grades for those restaurants, and we've got some nice new features. I hope you will check it out. Um, but I'm happy to take specific questions about the about restaurant grading. Great. So, Ed, on the grading systems, at which is the letter grade that restaurants are closed down? Can you elaborate a little bit on the system that's in place now, protecting um, our consumers? Sure. So we have. Uh, all of the all of the uh, conditions that restaurants need to follow that are that are laid out in the city's health code. So we have an, a provision of the health code that sets out all of the food safety requirements that restaurants need to meet. That health code is aligned with the New York State version of that called the State Sanitary Code and also is uh, aligned with the FDA's model food code. It's a, it's a living document. It's something that we look at uh, regularly and monitor changes in the industry and in food safety science to keep that health code up to date to continue to protect New Yorkers. So we lay out a series of conditions that restaurants need to follow to be aligned with the health code. It's something that we, uh, it's a, it, we have a checklist that we mail out to all of the restaurants and we publish that on the website as well. And our inspectors basically follow that checklist when they do an inspection at a restaurant. Um, depending, we have a point system. It's all laid out in the rules, all uh, very transparent, provided to restaurants. Depending on the points that the restaurant gets at that inspection, that is then converted to an A, B, or a C. Um, and um, that is sort of the way that we let New Yorkers, we are kind of New Yorkers' eyes in the kitchen, and this is what we communicate, how we communicate that to New Yorkers. There is no cutoff for a closure. 
uh, closure, which by, by which I think you mean when we see a condition that makes we, that we think it's unsafe for New Yorkers to to uh, eat there, we will close that restaurant as a kind of a temporary measure, really an emergency measure, um, and require the restaurant to to correct whatever conditions um, exist that created that sort of emergency. There is no. There is no grade cutoff. There is no cutoff. There are a variety of circumstances that can lead to a to a closure, and it's something that uh, the inspector will report back to the office, and it's and it's uh, reviewed by s uh, levels of supervision until there is a decision. Because we know that it's a very uh, a very extreme measure, so we take that very seriously and and close that restaurant, and then work with them to help them reopen as quickly as possible in conditions that are safe uh, for New Yorkers. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. So it's uh, safe to assume that New Yorkers have come to rely on this letter grade and the in determining where they're going to eat. Uh, we have done some polling of New Yorkers, and we do believe that New Yorkers uh, do value the grade, and that many New Yorkers make decisions based on those grades. And these grades are visible on storefronts at the point of entry of these establishments and online. Yes. Can you help us understand how this current grading system, which New Yorkers have come to rely on, which uh, indicate the level of compliance by our food establishments, how this would be used at a ghost kitchen facility? If you even know where the facility is located. So facilities that are delivery only that we're describing here as ghost kitchens are subject to the very same health code food safety requirements that I just described. Um, they are permitted by the health department and, and inspected by us. And if they, like other restaurants, if they directly um, provide delivery to consumers, then they are also part of the, of the grading program. So Ghost kitchens are not your traditional brick and mortar commercial corridor uh, visible to the average person. Is that correct? Or Understood. More? Could be. Where would the letter grade be posted that a consumer seeking to purchase the food from an establishment, where would they be exposed to that information? So those grades, uh, as for any food service establishment that is part of the grading program, would be on the uh, at the at the location and also on our website. But these are not traditional brick and mortar storefront locations. They could be in a basement. They can be on a, a second floor, an upper floor. They can be in a warehouse. There would. It, what I'm gathering is there's a potential that a letter grade is not known to a consumer. So based the, on visual patronage. Right. The, the grade, the grade uh, shows the consumer what we see at that, at that location um, and is on our website. Now, on a website, you would identify the restaurant or the food handler, the, the, the restaurant that, or the name associated with that restaurant would receive the grade, correct? The, the, the way that the consumer looks it up is based on the, on the restaurant name, yes. Which is affiliated through Consumer Affairs, Department of Health Licenses. Is part of the Health Department permit. Correct. Yes. Ghost kitchens allow for multiple names or virtual kitchens to be used. <coughs> Am I correct? Uh, that's, what I, that's what I hear you describing, yes. And those names may not be n in your database. Uh, it would depend on how that uh, how that establishment is set up. There are different models for these, so they may or may not be on the on the website. Uh, it, it it will depend it will depend on how they are structured. So a structure could exist where a restaurant could have one name with a letter grade, where your agency knows of their physical location is able to inspect and operate under other names. You know, that's something I'm, I'm, I'll have to take a look at. I think, I think you might be right, and it's an interesting point that you're raising, and we can come back and take a look at it. It's, it's not that different from um, other kinds of restaurants where the food is not actually prepared on site. 
So from our point of view, this is a, a twist on other models that exist, but I understand where, what, you're, what you're saying, and we'll, we'll go back and we'll take a look at that. Let me further elaborate. I'll give you an example. Uh, Mikado Bistro, known restaurant, complying with the uh, Department of Health, registered, has all of its licenses and uh, permits uh, necessary to operate. They received letter grades as low as C. The same establishment, the same restaurant, the same brick and mortar structure operates under several other names, such as Mikado Poke, New Mikado Sushi, Master Raman Bar, Chef Honoka Sushi, Raman uh, Yamato, and Mikado Raman. That is one, two, three, four, five, six other names that it operates under. Yet, when we search one of these other affiliates on our database, there is no letter, there is no grade associated to that restaurant, but yet the food is being prepared from the same brick and mortar restaurant, the same kitchen, as Mikado with a grade of C. My concern would be, as I'm sure to the New Yorkers that have rely and rely on these letter grades to indicate whether or not they're going to purchase the food from this eatery, and they've used it as a guide, they're not aware that they may be purchasing food from an establishment that is not up to code or a standard that they feel comfortable with. How are we allowing this to happen? So what I'd like to do is follow up with your office and get that list, and it's something we can take a look at. It's, it's an interesting point, and we're happy to take a look and think about what else we might be doing. Well, Deputy Commissioner, I think it's more than interesting. It should be an alarm and a concern, especially when we're dealing with foods like sushi or shellfish or um, that New Yorkers and people have allergic reactions to or uh, could be their health could be in jeopardy because we're not informing them of the standard that those kitchens and restaurants are operating at, which is contrary to what our traditional brick and mortar establishments are currently held to. I think it's much more alarming that we understand and the more we discuss this, the more alarms and bells should be ringing in our minds as government and agencies and departments and the roles that we have to protect uh, New Yorkers. Letter C in a sushi restaurant or seafood restaurant, I can assure you would deter people from eating there. But if you're operating under a bistro name, not aware that your seafood is being prepared at that same eatery, it's deception. What are your thoughts? So the, you know, we're, we're very committed to transparency. Um, that's why we launched the restaurant grading program and have been putting more and more inspection data up online for New Yorkers. And again, I'd like to take a look at that and maybe that's an example that we can use to dig into this. I, I hear your point, I think it's, a, it's an important one. We are concerned about food safety and we know that uh, leveraging New Yorkers com consumer uh, power has been very, very helpful in helping restaurants um, comply with the health code. So it's an important point. That's what we are interested in. We are interested in compliance with the food safety rules, and we want to uh, promote transparency to encourage that. So what I'd like to do is follow up and use those examples to help us take a look at this. Deputy, I uh, thank you for that response. Um, I'm truly concerned that we're jeopardizing um, New Yorkers by exposing them uh, to restaurants that are not operating at a standard uh, that they are entitled to uh, make a decision on. Um, I'm going to mention some other things that should be alarming to us, and I'm glad that the commissioner's here as well. We know that uh, so many people are allergic to selfish. The word bistro does not indicate that shellfish are on their menu. But when you see a name specifically associated to seafood, 
and many New Yorkers, including my own friends and family members, do not dine in establishments where they know seafood is on the menu because of the severe allergic reactions that they could have. So in this case, and just using one as an example of a Mercado Bistro that operates with six other names where four indicate specific seafood use should be more than a concern. And when we think of perhaps allergic reactions to peanuts and nuts that so many of us experience in our own households with our own family members, we would not know that, I'll use an example like a Thai restaurant that relies heavily on peanuts and nuts, could be operating as another food establishment that would give a consumer a level of comfort and not even think of asking the question about peanuts and nuts uh, interacting with their food that they could have an allergic reaction. I'm stressing the importance of this as a health concern, Deputy Commissioner. And I'm not looking to, and the Commissioner is probably concerned, now is looking at us as, what are we looking to do, close these establishments down? Absolutely not. But we need to be much more aggressive in determining the type of food for transparency, the letter grades that inform our customers, New Yorkers, give them the information they need to better determine whether or not they will patronize a establishment. And in this case, the establishment is a virtual establishment. And there is no letter grade that your agency can associate to these restaurants. Commissioner, New Yorkers, New York City relies on a tax base and the employment base and the services that these establishments provide. They are vital to our economy. They are vital to our city. I, I want to work with you alongside the Department of Health to ensure that they continue to thrive and provide the services that are so desperately relied on but not at the health risk, not at a level where we're not transparent as to who's the operator, at what level of uh, standard are they operating at. The current models that exist now could undermine the very existence of the traditional brick and mortar restaurant. We see our commercial corridors the vacancy rates, which are concerning to us. And when commercial vacancies occur on some of our main thoroughfares, they also bring less foot traffic to those areas, which is then a downward spiral on the other small businesses. We should be proactive, not reactive. I encourage you both to start looking at this before there's a problem. Not stop it from, not stop change in evolution and technology, but help shape it where, it where it is a partnership that other small businesses benefit from and New York benefits while being transparent and putting the interest, the health concerns first. What, the little we understand and know, and that's why these hearings are so important. Traditionally, if there was an example of a mouse dropping in a location, it would impact that establishment. In a shared kitchen facility with a common corridor, who would get that violation where a number of restaurants wall-walled, closed doors, operate independently, but yet the storage facility, which they use jointly, has mouse droppings or the corridor that connects to their refrigeration shared and 
dry storage areas, which is shared. In this case, according to the rules and how they're implemented, who would get that violation? So in the situation that you just described, it is the owner of the overall facility who also has a permit who is responsible for the common areas and the facilities issues. I'm sorry, please elaborate once more on that. So in the situation that you just described, the, uh, the owner of the overall facility is responsible and has a permit from us and is responsible for the common spaces. And for example, um, the, the facilities issues that, and pest, and pest control. And that would be quite different than from the common space of a traditional brick and mortar single occupied restaurant. If there was mouse droppings in their waiting area, that would impact that food establishment, correct? So the owner of a restaurant that is not shared, the owner is who ha holds the permit is responsible for all aspects of that restaurant. In a shared kitchen, there is dual responsibility. The owner of the overall facility is responsible for those common areas. The uh, restaurant that is uh, essentially renting a space there is responsible for what happens in their space, their food preparation, for example. Does the common operator get a letter grade? I'll have to get back to you. There are letter grades for shared kitchens, but let me get back to you about exactly how those, how those grades So an example work. like Zool, operating under a similar scenario, the Zool operator would have the license that you, the umbrella, that would receive violations. And they may or may not get a letter grade. So I don't know this particular operator, and it'll depend on how they have structured their, their business. So we can take a look at any particular entity that ha runs one of these uh, delivery-only businesses and see how they have structured well, themselves. My understanding is Zool, and we're using them as example, does not get a letter grade. So a violation that's issued to Zool that does not impact their letter grade and not impacting the other shared kitchen operators is negative, is misleading at best and not complying with the intent of the letter grade system. Isn't this a concern for us? It is something that we're looking at to see how we might be able, whether there's more we should be doing in terms of transparency. So the, the kinds of things that you're raising are something, some of the things that we're thinking about. And so it's very helpful to hear um, that this is a concern. We are thinking about this and where else should letter grades apply and what would be useful to New Yorkers? What information would be useful to New Yorkers so that they can make these decisions, both as a matter of expanding transparency and because we know that New Yorkers making these decisions is what is motivating restaurants uh, is one of the things that's motivating restaurants to maintain very high food safety standards. We have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm going to ask you another question that can be directed to both of you. Um, and I want to elaborate because there's, the more I think about this, the more that comes to mind. So we have religious concerns, whether it be halal food or kosher food. Could you imagine what we're allowing to occur Aside from the health concerns from peanuts and shellfish and other known um, foods that uh, have allergic reactions that can impact a person's well-being, could there be a scenario where a shared kitchen is operating under the pretense of halal or kosher, allowing to market their products to a specific targeted audience and in the shared kitchen facility, there could be a compromise to the authenticity of that product. And I'll let either one of you answer that question. So, I mean, um, I, I think what you're raising is, is the fact that what we are both saying is that, um, you know, ghost kitchens, it's a, it's a new phenomenon, and we're looking at um, and we're working closely with the industry to understand, you know, where the challenges can be for the industry and where there are opportunities. 
Um, you know, you're, you're specifically on the health side, I think our, my colleague is saying that, you know, there, there's things that we need to look at. Um, uh, and for us on the, on the business side, because you have, um, and I have reinforced that message, you know, our, the, the industry is important to New York City. It's important to the fabric of neighborhoods. And we want to make sure that our small, our mom and pop restaurants are not I impacted negatively from this, uh, but more so that they may actually uh, see an opportunity. Uh, because there's a number of, as you know, uh, technology is, uh, in, uh, has disrupted a number of industries. Um, and we want to always make sure that our small businesses are prepared to pivot uh, to grow and take advantage of new income opportunities. Uh, we have seen uh, some restaurants actually um, expand their delivery capacity uh, by utilizing uh, one of these models. Uh, but to your point, uh, there are certain challenges that we wanna make sure that we don't allow, um, whether it is uh, cross-contamination or anything like that, um, that we, we make sure that we address that as well. Uh, it is relatively new. Um, we've heard concerns from the industry. We work closely with the industry and we'll continue to listen to the industry um, and make adjustments to the way we operate uh, based on what we hear. So while we have a responsibility to make sure these businesses continue to thrive and succeed, we also have responsibility to consumers. And that's the point that Absolutely. I'm making and, here. And you know, the fact that we're having this hearing, I think is, it's, it's uh, timely uh, because this industry, it's, it's nascent. So we wanna make sure, uh, to your point, um, if this is a business model that uh, could increase the capacity of our small businesses to, to uh, small restaurants to actually grow and utilize the fact that consumer behavior is changing. Uh, we have talked about this where your kids, they no longer go to restaurants, right? They order from the phone and you keep on telling them to put down the phone. Uh, but a lot of consumers are, are focused on, on the fact that, you know, uh, convenience. Um, and I think, I, and you and I have hammered this message a number of times, sometimes convenience uh, we have to educate New Yorkers what that truly means. Um, and when you, uh, you are looking to get delivery the day of, uh, what you're doing is you're removing or you're actually eliminating a sale from a neighborhood business. And that business uh, could, it could be, and that business is a fabric of a neighborhood. Um, and if you're not buying from that business, what you're saying is that you're not gonna support that business and you're not gonna support that neighborhood. So I think with this, um, you know, with ghost kitchens, we need to make sure uh, that not only do we prepare our, our small restaurants to understand what this is and how they can actually take advantage of that and, and, um, and leverage the fact that people are using their phones to order in um, to grow their capacity there, but we also want to make sure, to your point, that we do not uh, create an atmosphere where those same small businesses that are the fabric of the neighborhoods are uh, impacted ne negatively uh, from this. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, the industry numbers are 35 billion, expected to grow to 300, tenfold that in the next 10 years. It's, um, it's incumbent upon us to be involved in this as we help shape and navigate um, these credible numbers that were faced without undermining existing battles or, or existing concerns. And rightfully so, our restaurants uh, are suffering day in and day out. Uh, not only from competition, um, uh, online uh, ordering, third-party third food apps that are yielding a net loss in many cases for these restaurants, charging as high as 33% for delivery, and we know that these establishments are not making that level of profit on an order. It's our responsibility to be there to make sure that this partnership is one we both benefit from where the data and what could have been at one time a good working relationship and partnership that both benefited from can turn around and undermine the very existence of that restaurant just by simply using the data that was the, taken from the, the establishment, their own client, and given to another restaurant, or worse, be used to open up your own kitchen selling the same products or menu as your very client giving competition and unfair advantage to these virtual kitchens and shared kitchens and third party food delivery apps. I'm concerned. You know the numbers yourself. 80% of restaurants never make it to year five. And if we allow a model which could 
undermine their very existent business models. We have to be involved, attentive, and proactive. I'm going to give, I'm going to ask one more question before I pass it over to uh, my colleague, um, Council Member Perkins, if he has any questions. But are any of you concerned about the health effects for an average New Yorker of eating out more at restaurants and less often at home. We know that at home, typically, you're buying fresher products, cooking uh, with less salt, uh, a balanced meal. Um, and, and many times in homes, they feel like restaurants because you're catering to, depending on the, your children's eating desires. Uh, <laughs> The menu could be one thing, and you can operate like a typical restaurant. But are you concerned about the direction New Yorkers are going in, where they're eating less at home, they're spending less time preparing their foods, and dining out, which has an impact on our local grocery stores as well, and supermarkets, which is another business that is being impacted. So I want to make sure that we see overlapping rings here. Um, across the board, um, which we know are struggling now to compete, whether you be a small grocery store, a bodega, or a mid-sized or small supermarket, where they could barely compete against big box uh, supermarkets, these mega supermarkets that exist. Is that a concern for either one of you? So I'll take the, the, the last part of the question in terms of um the small supermarkets, bodegas uh, competing. Um, it is a concern and it is one of the reasons why we launched Lovely Local because we wanted to make sure that we uh, understand what are some of the interventions that we need to help our small businesses adapt. Um, and when I say adapt, there are certain things that we know that you know, no matter how convenient online is, you just, you just still need to go out um, to the store. Um, and we want to make sure that we understand what that is, uh, what are those products, um, and we want to make sure that the businesses in our communities understand how to actually pivot uh, to make sure that they still remain competitive. I will always say that small businesses will always have a competitive advantage uh, because that owner knows who you are. That owner knows the type of product that you want, um, whether, you want to, whether you're coming in for a cup of coffee, they know how you want your coffee, uh, or whether it is you, you have a particular uh, type of um, you know, product or, or food or whatever it is that you like, they know you. Um, and no matter how sophisticated uh, you get with technology and uh, you know, artificial intelligence, there's something about that human interaction that will always keep small businesses at a competitive advantage. However, uh, there are changes that's happening. Um, and we know that uh, with online purchasing, uh, the convenience of being able to sit in my living room and order you know, the week's groceries and it, it gets delivered the next day, um, we want to make sure that you know, we help our small businesses adapt to that. And in some cases, it could be moving particular products that you can't order online uh, because you need to actually touch and feel and actually uh, maybe even smell uh, moving those products or maybe even adding those products uh, to your inventory mix. Uh, maybe understanding a little bit better of what your inventory looks like and eliminating the products that sit longer. Uh, these are sort of in using technology to make sure, you know, because a lot of folks when they move into neighborhoods, the first thing they do, they go online and search. Uh, if you do not have online presence as a small business, if you're not necessarily accessible uh, online, then you're missing out on that. So we have programs uh, where it's either how to uh, have a better search engine optimization strategy. Uh, a lot of small business owners don't even know what SEO means, and so we educate small business owners on what that looks like. Uh, we help them develop that, uh, how to b develop an e-commerce strategy. Uh, really how to in incorporate technology into your business. And certainly with Love Your Local, one of the things we saw was lack of uh, understanding of the inventory. Um, and then the other part was then figure out ways to uh, change your display in your, your business uh, to make it more attractive uh, for the things that people need immediately. Uh, so we are concerned. We will continue to learn from our, our learnings from um, Love Your Local and, and the feedback that we're getting right now. Um, and that will influence the, the type of services that we will build out um, at SBS uh, or uh, the different classes that we will have to help business owners adapt. 
Commissioner, Deputy? So we know that New Yorkers love to eat out and eat out a lot. Um, and it's one of the, you know, our vibrant and um, varied uh, restaurant industry is, is one of the core things in New York that makes it a wonderful city. So from the health department's perspective, we see this as the restaurant setting can be a place to provide information to New Yorkers about health. And so we've had initiatives over the years um, to be providing information about calories and sodium and eliminating trans fats in, trans, in uh, chain restaurants. The council in the last year has also enacted some new laws um, providing information to New Yorkers in the restaurant setting and so it's it is an important um it is an important setting um for for health messaging given how often new yorkers eat out i want to thank both of you and um for being here today uh, we have our work ahead of us uh, we outlined uh, some of the work and i'm sure much more uh, will come uh, to mind as we dig deeper into this uh commissioner from small i'm grateful to you for your friendship and the work that you do to protect our small businesses and understanding how viable they are and we can't afford to lose any one small business let alone an entire industry that could be threatened um, and currently is being threatened uh, by these third party food apps and which has brought us to the point we are today just a continuation of that model that has led us to this hearing um, I'm fearful of the future for the traditional mom and pop restaurant. The chains and the franchises and the uh, owners that have multiple locations um, have the expertise and the infrastructure in place to adapt. Our local eateries, our long-standing eateries that have become household names in our communities are not prepared for this. I'm not sure how we're going to help them. But these models could threaten their very existence. And with that, it's a loss of a business, a loss of employees, and loss of a tax base, and a concern that with these vacancies, there is no assurance that someone else will come in. They will be faced with the same challenges so yes, consumer behavior change, challenge, changes to big box store competition and the internet has changed the world as we know it. We have to be much more proactive and come up with creative ideas so it's a fair system. Deputy Commissioner, we have real concerns. I'm hopeful that uh, today we shed light on some of those concerns the need for transparency and put in the health and safety of our New Yorkers first, especially when it comes to allergies and grading systems, which we have come to rely on to determine whether or not we will patronize an establishment. I want to thank you, and I don't know if uh, Council Member Perkins has any questions for either one of you. might be considered to be some sort of dangerous uh, perspective that, that's being brought to our attention as to how the industry is managing its uh, performance for the customers that, uh, do you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, so, 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 so for instance, do you share uh, some of the concerns that have been presented already just in this preliminary conversation and can you respond to that some of those concerns or how those concerns have met you and how you respond yeah so I just um, as I indicated in my testimony we um, at small business services we have uh, an industry partnership uh, with the restaurant and uh, the food and beverage industry um, so we have individuals from the industry who um, alert us to different concerns 
um, and challenges. Um, and our goal as government is not only to listen, but also to be responsive. Uh, so uh, everything from the workforce um, and the lack of um, skills in particular areas uh, that is well needed in the restaurant industry, like line cooks, uh, we were responsive to that. Uh, we still continue, and it's a work in progress, to address the regulatory environment, and we talked about this a number of times. Uh, so yes, so uh, outside of media reports, uh, we heard um, concerns from the industry about uh, ghost kitchens, uh, but we have yet, um, in terms of getting data to measure the impact, um, we, have, we don't have that yet. Uh, so that's why I said this conversation is timely, uh, because we will be continuing to talk to the industry understand you know, how it's actually affecting, especially our mom and pop uh, restaurants, um, and what we can do as a city uh, to respond to that. And as I said, and I think the council member shares this, uh, we're not saying that we, we don't want to see this uh, flourish. We wanna make sure that we just um, uh, make sure that our small restaurants have the ability to take advantage of this, maybe to actually increase their sales. Uh, but we also wanna make sure that um, it doesn't decimate uh, the industry um, that's already dealing with a number of challenges. There's no question that the decimation of the industry is not on your agenda, <laughs> or any of our agenda for that matter. However, the, the dialogue that's taking place represents a very uh, uh, great likelihood that the industry may be in some kind of danger, and that the customer the, 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 the folks who are going to, uh, I guess, support the industry in terms of their uh, pro the products that they provide and the needs that the people might have to want to have those products. Uh, how do we? How do we assume? Let's say, for instance, the worst case scenario, as may to some extent have been expressed already. How do we? How do we tackle that? How do we? How do we? Uh, uh, assure the consumer, the, the, the public, that this is not as bad as, as it is obviously being, to some extent, portrayed. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of education. Um, uh, to your point, I think consumers need to know, um, you know the impact of their, their choices. Um, so you know, uh, I have uh, continually uh, reminded uh, New Yorkers that you know, support your local small business, um, support your local restaurant, um, I think, you know... Well, that's already happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, 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 obviously, the consumers are supporting these businesses that are still in, still in operation. The problem becomes, I think, from the, from the conversation we're having, is that there is a, a measure of uh, concern about the quality of, of what the consumer is engaging and uh, the transparency, to some extent, of... How, how this this industry is operating, so to speak, on be, on behalf of the consumer. Mm -hmm. so that, that, does that challenge? They, do you do you do you see that challenge? And does it? And has it, if, if it sounds like the, the concerns that you're um, referring to are with food safety, and we don't we don't see anything we don't see that specific to these kinds of delivery only businesses. Um, that we're talking about here. The same requirements apply to them, the same inspection happens. I think that th we have highlighted some areas um, where there's an interest in expanding transparency and we're happy to look at that. The transparency, um, as I've noted, is, is um, a priority for us and so we can look at that. But in terms, I don't want New Yorkers to feel like these are not businesses that are um, regulated and inspected by the health department. They are. But there seems to be somewhat of a hue and cry about how much of this is actually taking place. That, 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 that's what's on, that seems to be the, the nature to, some, to a significant extent of the conversation that there's some skepticism, to say the least, about how well the industry is being managed. As, well, I, I do want to assure it. It's performing. I want to. In terms of the, mm -hmm. the, the reaction of the, of the consumers, I guess. So I do want to assure New Yorkers if the concern is that these are businesses that are outside our purview, that is not true. They are businesses that are, from our point of view, these are food service establishments. 
They are required to get our permit. They are required to follow the same uh, health code food safety rules, and they are subject to the same inspections. I can also, in case this, this might be um, helpful in preparation for this hearing, I, I spoke to the director of, our, uh, of the unit that conducts foodborne illness outbreak investigations and asked her to take a look over the last few years to see if she saw anything in her investigation history that would suggest that we're seeing some new trend, and, and, and we're not. So from a food safety perspective, um, these are, are the same kind of food service establishments that we see. The delivery only is, is different. Perhaps some of the transparency issues is an area we can work in so that New Yorkers can have information that they want, but New Yorkers shouldn't feel that these are out of our, out of our sight. We, we know about this, we are inspecting them, and they are subject to the very same important food safety requirements. So, uh, but how are New Yorkers reaching out to let you know how they feel about this? Or how, how are you communicating? New Yorkers I mean, we take, we take uh, if New Yorkers want to have a complaint, we take a complaint. Um, we follow up on all of the complaints through 311. And it doesn't matter how they receive their food. Sit down at a fancy restaurant, take out delivery, we take all of those complaints. I don't think we have heard any particular concerns yeah. from New Yorkers about this. I think that these, the concerns may be coming um, to SBS as an industry matter, but from the health department, we have not heard anything. Uh, as far as I know, uh, we have not heard anything particular about this. This scenario that, that there is something that you haven't heard that you would be alarmed about if you did hear it, and how would you go about searching that out to confirm one way or the other what is actually the reality that, that the consumers are experiencing. That's, that's what my concern I is. You, so, I, you, you need to make sure, let's assume it's all gossip. Let's assume it's all exaggerated. Let's assume the worst case scenario that it's, it's something that, uh, that, that is uh, perceived, if not in fact happening. But sometimes perception for people is more important than the fact. If they think the system is not working on their behalf, then they're going to react as if it's not working on their behalf. How do we challenge that and, and, and overcome that perception? Let's assume it's a misperception or something like that. So I think there's a couple ways to think about your question. One is, one of the things that I think was really wonderful about restaurant grading was uh, that fine. it not only uh, <laughs> showed New Yorkers where restaurants were not practicing um, optimal food safety um, uh, uh, requirements, were not meeting them at a, at a high level. It also showed New Yorkers places that you might think were not practicing high food safety standards, but actually they got an A. So one of the ways that we uh, counter some of those perceptions is through restaurant grading, which is why I think your points about transparency are very important. In conclusion, for me, so you you might be saying that it's a it's a you have a PR problem, <laughs> the public relations in the sense of what the what the community is perceiving to be the reality versus what the negative reality, as opposed to something much more positive. And so, therefore, I, I think you have to help folks understand that everything is okay. Well, that's right, and that was, and I think that was one of the really powerful things about restaurant grading. We think of it as it let New Yorkers find out who was not practicing good food safety standards, the restaurants that got a C. But one of the other great things that restaurant grading did is it let New Yorkers see that a place that they might have been worried about, actually, we went in there, we're the eyes in the kitchen for New Yorkers, and what we saw was good food safety practices, and I think that that's a way that it, it has been helpful to restaurants. In the end, we have more than 90, about 93% of restaurants now have, a, have an A in the window. Um, and so I, I think that that addresses some of your, some of the kinds of things that you're describing. But also, if it's not about perception, if it's about a real issue um, that New Yorkers have experienced, we, as I said, we take complaints, we follow up on all of those complaints. That's our routine food safety inspection program. We have another program that, uh, addresses foodborne illness 
outbreaks, we are taking in reports of, uh, of foodborne, of potential foodborne illness. We have a surveillance team that is monitoring those, looking for patterns in space and time. And we have a really robust follow-up to that, which includes both following the people who have complained to try to understand what has happened with those cases, and also an examination, an environmental investigation at those restaurants. So both in letting New Yorkers know what we are seeing during our routine inspections, following up on complaints, and also doing these investigations for the unusual uh, situations where we do have uh, foodborne illness. Just one final question. In, in, in your following up on complaints, how is, does that follow-up uh, touch the consumer? Um, so, well, how they, does the consumer become aware of the follow-up and the value of the follow-up, mm -hmm. the changes that have been made? And what is the, the So the particular the complainant that will come in through 311 and they get a service request number and all of that information is available to the consumer to find out how, uh, what our activity was. So, uh, are there sort of like consumer reports that sort of spell out some of the challenges and how they've been overcome? So the, in, in their, if a consumer who calls 311 and, and, and uh, wants to follow up on their service re uh, request number can do that. And also on our ABC Eats um, uh, website, we report our, the inspection history for the last three years. So New Yorkers who are very interested and want to look into the history of their, uh, of their favorite spot um, can do that. Not only what, what grade do they have in the window right now, but they can look and see what has been the pattern of practice for those restaurants. We make all of that available. So if it's, if it's possible, whatever reports talks in that regard that you might have or that you may do, I would appreciate it if my office could have a copy of, of such reports. Well, we can certainly send you the, the link to the website so you can look at that. Thank you, Council Member. I want to thank you both, uh, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner, for being here. And thank uh, you. Looking forward to our follow-up conversations. Um, we're going to call up a panel, and uh, there was a request made um, because of time issues. And we have Jim Collins, Sean Fitzgibbons, and Corey Manchion. Commissioner, uh, before you leave, I'm sure you're leaving staff here uh, for the remainder of the hearing. Perfect. Um, Gentlemen, if it's okay, we'll begin with you, Jim, and move in uh, the step of water. Mr. Collins, if you could just recap quickly, because there's people in the audience that may not have sure. been Thank privy you. to this as of yet. Thank you. Uh, I'm the CEO of Kitchen United. Kitchen United is an operator of uh, what we call kitchen centers and what in the city of New York is um, coming to be called dark or ghost kitchens. Um, we, are, we have plans to deploy facilities uh, in the New York City area. We don't know how many yet. It'll depend on the market. Um, our operating method is to um, use uh, distressed retail space um, in a seven to 10,000 square foot um, range and use, and uh, we work with a combination of national and local restaurants. Um, usually about 30 to 40 percent of our space is filled with uh, larger chains, and then 60 to 70 percent is filled with uh, local uh, restaurants. Um, Mr. Collins, you just indicated that you work primarily with chains and uh, larger established restaurants or eateries, correct? Um, that's your preference of? So the, um, the first third of our space uh, we reserve for the larger um, restaurant chains, but we reserve two thirds of the space for local restaurants. We honestly find uh, local restaurants have better success energizing consumers in the local neighborhoods than the national chains do. Okay. 
I'm going to ask a few questions across the board afterwards. Sure. Teach him. Uh, sir, if you can introduce yourself. And yeah, so uh, founder and CEO of, of Zool Kitchens, uh, Corey Manicone. You have an opening statement for us? I will, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, my name is Corey Manicone. I'm the founder and CEO of Zool Kitchens. Uh, joining me today is also my co-founder, Sean Fitzgibbons. Uh, and also Chief Business Development Officer. Um, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Council Member Mark uh, Jonaj. Johnny, and I just wanted to, you don't have to read that whole statement. If you could just sum it up for us, it's quite lengthy and uh, we're a little pressed for time and I apologize. Absolutely. So uh, I, again, we are the co-founders of, of Zool Kitchens here in New York City, um, very similar to, to uh, a Gym and Kitchen United. Uh, we operate facilities that allow brands to come in and operate in a delivery-only capacity. Uh, very fortunate to open up New York City's first ghost kitchen facility last September. Uh, it is a 5,000 square foot facility actually just located outside of Soho. Uh, it's, it's equipped with nine individual four-walled kitchens where we have six brands occupying said kitchens. Um, uh, the majority of them being local shops here in, in New York City, such as Sarge's Deli, Murray Hill uh, Deli Institution, 55 years, um, to Stonebridge Pizza, uh, who's a, a, a one-stop shop in uh, Midtown as well. Uh, also would like to uh, thank the committee, as Corey referenced. My name is Sean Fitzgibbons. I'm co-founder and chief business development officer uh, with Zool as well. I want to thank you gentlemen for being here. So help us understand, are you a threat to our local mom and pop restaurants or should you be embraced as a partner that's going to help them uh, continue to flourish and grow and uh, benefit from um, the low cost, efficient manner which you operate in and while benefiting consumers, New Yorkers? Yeah, absolutely. I, I you know, Candidly, I think this is an incredibly archaic and challenging industry. Um, my father actually owned an IHOP uh, while I was growing up out in Colorado. Uh, massive success, which led to opening up a bar and grill, um, which is where I really begin to see just how challenging this industry can, can present itself. Uh, and without going into too much detail, saw my parents go through incredible hardship and, and unfortunately lose both restaurants. Uh, and I think there's an immense opportunity for folks such as ourselves um, to truly partner and, and, and be the, the operational partner for brands that uh, really uh, is, is a necessity in the market today. I think there's a lot of quote unquote disruption happening in the, the restaurant industry, but it's unfortunately on the backs of the operators. Um, so it's incredibly important for, for us at Zool uh, is, is to position ourselves as a true partner. Right, the, 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 the tide is rising and, and, and we you know, help these brands kind of ride the wave, if you will. Yeah, I guess the way I'd, I'd approach the, the question is I, I would say you know, one person's threat is often another person's opportunity. And um, the extent to which uh, a small business or restaurant um, understands the changing landscape and um, is able to un understand how to adapt their business to it and approach it. Um, I, I really strongly believe we present an, an interesting new opportunity for them to grow uh, in, a, in a fashion that uh, requires uh, dramatically less capital, um, dramatic, dramatically less financial risk um, than you know anything that's really been presented to them before. And so, um, Change frightens people, and, and I commend uh, the councilman and the committee for the time you've obviously spent in understanding the industry. This is the first uh, session like this that I know of anywhere in the country. I believe that these should be happening all over the place, and that might come as a surprise to you given that I'm an operator of one of these ghostly dark you know, spaces. Um, but we really truly hope that um, one of our tenants in, in, at Kitchen United is uh, that we're really committed to the success of our restaurant partners and to educating the restaurant community with regard to the challenges and opportunities created by the industry we're uh, working hard to create. I want to thank you, Mr. Collins, and it should be no surprise to you that New York leads the way for the rest of the country in many instances, and this should be, this is just one example. It, it is not a surprise. Thank you for that. So the, the, obviously you are, your models also rely on profit, otherwise you're not Mother Teresa, right? You're not here to help these eateries establish themselves. Explain to me about the 
the percentages? Are you flat fee based? Are you flat fee plus percentage based? Explain to us the model as it currently works with both of your establishments and they may be the same practices. And I'll let either one go first. Sure. I, I guess I'm gonna, I'll show you mine. <laughs> um, Keep your company secrets. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, Kitchen United uh, business model is effectively a membership model. So our restaurants pay a membership fee to be in our facility. It's structured very similar to a lease. Um, in addition to that, if they choose to opt in to um, Kitchen United's um, own order management system, um, which is another order channel of, that we make available to our restaurant partners, um, then the orders that they take through that restaurant channel, they'll pay um, Kitchen United a 15% fee uh, for those orders. Thank you. Yeah, so what we've been able to execute on to date uh, is, is generally a flat membership fee, similar to what Jim had, had referenced. Um, at the early onset here, what we're also exploring is an element of a revenue share structure with the restaurant brand as well, um, where we're sharing on the upside or the top line revenue that we proactively are driving for the restaurant operator to ensure their business is success. Uh, I think what's uh, important to, to highlight as well is we're partnering with these restaurant brands um, and went to market with a flat membership fee. Uh, what we also realized was that we wanted to make sure that the, the economics of the model and the unit economics as it specifically pertained to the restaurant brand um, would ensure their success. So one of the variables that we incorporated as a best practice was financial modeling with the restaurant operators, understanding, uh, as I referenced, their own need in economics, what their average check size were, what some of their EBITDA metrics goals are, what their labor model looks like, what their cost of goods are. Um, and we factor those variables in to then, um, as a takeaway, really ensure that the type of ecosystem that we're creating and the economic structure guarantees the brands will be profitable and successful in our establishment. So basically, you're operating similar to a landlord-tenant relationship, but then you also have the shared, or not even shared profit, you have a percentage fee based on the sales that that independent operator or could be co-owned them gathering um, works under your umbrella. How is that profitable when we understand that the average profit on an order is anywhere between six and 11%. And if they're paying fees as high as 15%, I believe that's your number, uh, Mr. Collins. What is the number for Zulu? It's right around 15 as well. 15 as well. Yeah. That would actually mean a net loss on every transaction. Am I wrong here or my, or my math doesn't add up? Is one and one equaling two? So the um, six to eight percent number is a is a. First of all, um, I would say that a six to eight number, just being candid, um, would indicate a restaurant that isn't um, doing a good job of managing its costs. Your, uh, if if you're an average restaurant in the United States, your profit margin on a per plate basis is about is actually around ten percent. That still leaves you upside down on the math you're doing. So there's not a lot of point in me in me saying it other than just you know, the, the probably the right, the accepted number would be 10. Um, and by the way, we, the operating costs in New York City are a little bit different yeah, than the rest of the true, country true, from yeah. so, real estate taxes, water and sewer, and minimum wage, and regulations, and the fines, and the licensing. Yeah. It's a different environment. Yeah, so my uh, minimum wage in uh, Los Angeles is $15 an hour, and I don't get a tip credit for my servers. I'm, I'm uh, acutely aware of the, uh, um, of the profit challenge created by um, just the changing climate in the, in the world we're, we're living in. I think the, we knew that when we started KU, we knew that Kitchen United, we knew that uh, one of the challenges our restaurants would face would be profitability because of the commissions charged for orders. And so we wanted to make sure that restaurants um, could operate profitably and to do that, provide a shared labor model um, that takes, takes on all, basically a lot of the non-food producing um, aspects of running the facility so that the restaurants can literally operate in our facility 
with just their trained cooks um, operating in their kitchens. And that um, allows them actually to operate in these facilities in spite of the charges that they pay, typically at a higher margin than they would operate in their own uh, four wall space. And so um, it's one of the things actually we're proud of is you know, we're watching those metrics and working with our clients, but so far, uh, our restaurant clients are actually doing well on the profit side. Mr. Collins, I, I believe you've also indicated that some of your clients have traditional brick and mortar establishments. Yep. With all, existing, all, all of them do. They all do. Yep. So they're already paying rent, they already have a kitchen, they already have staff, they already have all the overhead and soft costs associated with operating a business. Why would it be profitable for them to have a shared kitchen and pay additional staff uh, rent, build out costs, whatever the minimum that dollar amount is according to what you just said, plus 15%? Why just not do it where they are now? So in a lot of cases, uh, the re if we're working with a restaurant that's local, we, we actually have restaurants that operate in a couple of our spaces where they, they have um, a local store that's within just a few blocks of our space. Um, the reason that they open with us is because what they find is that during their busy hours, um, you know, if you think about it, just uh, from a, from a, um, just a uh, common sense perspective, uh, people eat when people eat. They, you know, during the lunch hour, during the dinner hour, these are the bu busy hours for restaurants. Um, and so their brick and mortar establishments are, are basically, they were designed to serve what they felt their need would be during those busy hours. What's happening is, in addition to all the people coming into the restaurant during the busy hour, they also have a significant delivery demand during that hour, uh, off-premise demand, pickup or delivery demand during that hour. And in that case, uh, what they're doing is opening in a Kitchen United facility so that uh, they can effectively offload the pressure from that off-premise business into a nearby facility rather than having all that impact their uh, retail space. I understand what you're saying, but there's obviously a second rent, a second st or staff members that need to occupy. Um, and I'm, again, just, I'm not a conspiracy theory individual, but I'm just wondering, could this be a... Um, away for some of these restaurants as they build up their pickup only um, delivery um, orders to eventually close up their brick and mortar. And I share this only as I think more about the banking industry as an exit strategy, something that scares me and keeps me up at night when I reflect on vacancies and uh, our commercial corridors. Our traditional brick and mortar banks are on every corner in New York City. We're grateful to them for their real estate taxes that they contribute to our base and the employment that they create. But as more, less and less people use banks, and we go to the point where I've seen now and that, re that banks are selling their existing properties and renting them back as tenants. Now in my world, that's an exit strategy. I come from small business. If I own a property, why would I sell the property I'm currently occupying and then lease it back at a rent? I envision that someday with the consumer behavior changes, we won't need the traditional brick and mortar banks no longer. We'll operate out of kiosks, which means no need for bank tellers. Um, not sure the last time I walked into a bank was, and I'm sure many people in this room would agree with me. Could this be going in that direction? Whereas a restaurant is establishing this online presence, uh, stepping away from the more traditional eating, dining, creating an environment to where it establishes a uh, business model where it can close its brick and mortar, operate on a back street somewhere, pay less in retail rent, and be able to profit. 
Is this a concern that we should be looking at? It's an excellent question. Um, I think it's, a, it's also a sort of function of cause and effect. The, Wait, you know, does the business rise to change consumer, does, does the rise in a business model change consumer preference or does changing consumer preference change the business model? Um, I think what's happening in our world is that um, people who are, um, you know, more and more double in income families across the country, people are choosing not to cook. They're getting home later at night. Um, for whatever reason, cooking isn't a hobby. They just have decided not to cook. And for that reason, they're getting food delivered. I always, when I speak at conferences, I, the point, one of the points I, I make is the numbers right now seem to be suggesting to us that um, people are still going out to eat. They're just choosing not to cook at home. As you said in your opening remarks um, and in the earlier um, conversation, one of the kinds of businesses that's being impacted by this shift is the grocery business because the you know, consumer is not cooking at home, so they're not buying ingredients, and grocery stores are adapting to figure that out. Interestingly, um, the kinds of restaurants that we're working with that are located near us, um, you know, I, I don't think that they would ever consider closing the kinds of businesses that they have that are near us because it's, this, it's success that's driving the need to expand, not decline. And so um, these businesses are, you know, wildly successful uh, businesses that just need um, an, a, a financially reasonable way to expand um, to be able to meet this new consumer need. Um, whether at some point that drives a more nascent change in the, or, or a more fundamental change in the restaurant landscape will depend on what the consumer chooses that they want to do over time. But Jim, the basic principles of business is great and expanding, what we do is we expand this way or this way. We occupy more square footage um, where we share facilities, uh, share common charges. What you've just described is where they're now sharing or expanding at a complete different facility where there is more overhead for them versus expanding their existing establishment. I'm still having a difficult time understanding how this works. Now, unless you tell me that they could not expand because the, there's no vacancies uh, that allow them to expand their business and they're forced to move to a different location to offset some of the services that uh, uh, they, they, that they need to meet their, their, their consumer demand. I'm still not understanding how it could be profitable when you have a kitchen in place already. To have a second kitchen, I just don't understand that that other kitchen has to be not only the infrastructure, the investment for capital to begin with. When you have a sink here, having two sinks at two different locations, there's a cost factor. So what to use that sink, there's manual labor that is going to increase. And on top of that, pay rent and a percentage of every sale, which I think we're getting closer and closer to understanding, is a net loss at those percentages. And one of the reports, and you heard in my opening statement, for a food order establishment solely online, you have to do about a million dollars in transactions to, be, to break even. That was a number that um, I read out earlier. What is the profit level for an average <clears throat> client of yours? What is the break point for them? considering all these factors. Uh, uncomfortably, I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll yeah, try I to know. answer this question. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, and, and my, my uh, colleagues are uh, equally expert. And I feel a, a little um, like I monopolized the conversation. Um, I would tell you that uh, when we're working with restaurants looking to operate in Kitchen United facilities, um, the number that we talk about with them is a minimum of somewhere between um, 325 and 450 thousand to operate in our space in top line revenue, um, and we are uh, very careful of the restaurants that we actually allow to operate in our space um, because 
Uh, we want to make sure that the restaurants that are operating in our space are profitable and successful. Um, a restaurant's operating margin in a Kitchen United uh, facility today um, averages somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. What they're seeing is that their profit margin is actually significantly higher than, than the profit margin that they're achieving in their regular brick and mortar store. And they attribute this to much more efficient use of staff um, in these facilities, both because of the dynamics of delivery order versus retail pickup, and because the, uh, they, they don't have to uh, staff the facilities with uh, sort of management and support positions. Uh, those facility, those uh, um, functions are, are provided um, separately. So the restaurants um, operating in these spaces are actually able to uh, derive uh, margin gain by operating in the space. The, I understand, I'm so uh, uh, acutely aware uh, because of my position and, and what I do of the confusion in the market with regard to all of the, you know, it's a lot of change happening all at once, right? There's, there's sort of different topics. There's virtual restaurants. And different models and kitchens, different. Exactly, there's different <clears throat> models. There's even different models for ghost kitchens. There's all of that sort of thing. Um, I think that a um, conversation like this is uh, extraordinary and extraordinarily beneficial. Um, I would like to make myself available to you, and the other members of the council, um, at your request at whatever time um, is necessary um, in order to uh, be a resource for you um, and also trust and respect uh, the other gentlemen sitting at the table. With I, I want to thank the gentleman for your indulgence. I know that you had a loss in your family and my condolences to you on the loss and for uh, making it a point to be here um, and that you're flying out. Um, with that, I just want to bring up three quick things that you don't have to answer here that we'll follow up on. Data. Um, do any of your establishments sell liquor? No. No alcohol? Third, what prevents you from raising the rate from your 15% to 25 after a business has been established um, as proven profitable? Um, what prevents you from becoming a Trojan horse and taking over that existing model? you may have helped build by providing this growth opportunity in, but you also have on one hand the opportunity to throw him out or raise the rate and be able to take over his existing model under your own ownership. Yeah, happy to, um, happy to have those conversations with you. The, um, you know, I think what I would say on the, on the number three question is um, the consumer speaks loudly and clearly. Um, and and um, the, as, as we move forward, as we um, figure out how the business works, uh, there's no question in my mind that um, one of the big differences that we see between the international market and the U.S. market is the prevalence even of local brands and the power of those local brands in, in meeting um, the consumer. And um, consumers tend to look darkly on um, companies that impede access to their favorites and they look even more darkly on um, companies that damage their favorites. And so I think what you would find is that um, it's, it's in our best interest um, to work with those brands, help them flourish, make sure those brands are saying great things about us in the market because if that works then we have a really great um, symbiosis. Thank you again for the time. I just want to add to that. Yeah. While making a profit, right? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. If, they, if they don't make a profit, they move out. So <laughs> No, and you're a model as well. That's right. Are you making a profit currently? Oh, okay, great. Yeah. You better. Thank you. <laughs> Zul, I'm going to ask that you make a safe travels to you, Mr. Collins. And again, my condolences on your loss. Um, I, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for indulging me, understanding the circumstances, allowing Mr. Collins. Um, so you heard some of the questions. Yeah. And maybe you can help me understand yeah. better and uh, all the stakeholders uh, as to how this industry operates. And um, yeah, not only, not only from the data concerns, uh, but I do want to ask you before we get: Do you offer liquor sales, alcoholic beverages, as part of your platform? No. No interactions whatsoever.
So this isn't I can order a pizza from you as well as a six pack of beer. Not happening. Correct. Okay, good. Um, the data that you obtain through the transactions, is that co-owned? Are you allowed to, do you, does your business model um, keep that confidential? Are you allowed under your agreement to sell that data or use it for any other purpose that benefits you? Yeah, great question. So as it stands today, um, we're actually not capturing any of the data from the brand on an order basis. Uh, again, we wanted to take a step back. We weren't trying to reinvent the wheel completely. We wanted to de-risk the opportunity for these folks to, to expand their, their delivery or their digital business. Um, you know, that said, they still manage the relationships with all of the third parties. Um, however, we did actually just acquire a, a small little company out of Philadelphia that's gonna help us drive demands for our brands. Um, to the 15% that we were speaking to earlier. Uh, and we have full intention of, su uh, of, of supplying and, and being incredibly transparent around that data. So you don't see the transactions at all? The person making the order, the credit card, you're not involved in any of that at all? We just help them take the finished product from their kitchen up to the front and hand it off to the courier. That's you don't help marketing, you don't come up with um, uh, cons options and discussions to further enhance their profitability or market uh, of specific items? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely we do. We, we think about that all the time, right? And I, I know Jim um, was able to provide some insight on their approach. And, and one of the things that I think it's important to address here is that, you know, Corey and I are fortunate on a daily basis to talk to small business operators regionally here in New York City. One of the things that is very evident in terms of why they're electing to partner with Zool is based on the fact that there are a multitude of challenges that they're dealing with on a daily basis in this industry. I think we're all well aware of that. Um, and part of our objective then is to listen to the restaurant operator and understand how we can build a solution set to support those variety of challenges. So um, as we were referencing earlier about um, the use case for the business model, I'll, I'll bring to, to light a actual single unit operator that Corey mentioned earlier, Sarge's Deli, 55 year um, operator in Murray Hill. And what's happened to them over the last couple of years due to consumer habits is 40 to 50% of their overarching business has been driven by off premise dining. Consumers prefer the catering or delivery aspect of that business. Now, if you were to look at the logistics of operating in the city, one of the things that Sarge is, is doing, or unable to do, I should say, for Murray Hill, is actually deliver effectively from a logistics standpoint south of 14th Street. So part of their strategy of not only growing their business and allowing consumers the autonomy to access their product in new markets was partnering with Zool. And the, the reason that that was an appealing endeavor for Sarge's Deli was the nominal capex associated with expanding into new market share. And it was part of the marketing initiatives and overarching strategy that we developed to ensure they were successful. Are we going to curate their menu differently based off of what travels better or based off of what are top selling items that they're giving us insight from their own data that we can take into consideration as we're designing how their operation is going to work? or understanding what the hours of operation should be, knowing that we're supporting predominantly business in the financial district, which has a high peak of lunch hours um, and orders throughout the course of the day, or figuring out other creative ways to drive demand for them from marketing campaigns to ensure that their catering business is increasing, um, guaranteeing their success in the space as well. So all of those variables in the spirit of partnership and ensuring they're successful are taken into consideration by both us and the restaurant operator when we're looking to work together. Now, is it that on a case-by-case -case basis, or do you also use some of the data from the other customer clients that you may have? Um, for example, if we, one of them is selling garlic knots and the other one is not and he's a pizzeria or selling pizza, do you encourage them to start adding garlic knots to their menu? Uh, that the profit level is much greater there, rate of return, and you already have the existing dough. We know it works as next door to you. You have mm -hmm. the model here that we've seen the markup and how it works. Is Does that occur or yeah, can I, it occur? I, th I think more specifically what's been fascinating is that uh, 
that does occur after we've established an element of trust with each independent restaurant operator. You know, today there's so many different solutions being proposed to them in the restaurant industry that generally don't always have their best interest in mind of ensuring they're a successful operator. And uh, Mr. Ganaj, after we've been able to establish an element of trust, what happens over a period of time is the restaurant operator then shares insights into their data, into what menu items are selling more than others, um, specific times of days, what the margin is for them on respective product sets. And what we're able to do then is analyze how do we curate a menu, how do we cross-utilize product to allow them to be thinking a little bit more uh, differently about how they're going to build a menu set in this type of operation, again, uh, ensuring they're successful. Do you also go to the extent of determining that a product that they may be selling or offering on their menu is a net loss to them, um, that is not perhaps priced correctly? Occasionally, I think depending on the operator and, and the extent of their knowledge in, in terms of their own menu set, sure, we can have conversations about ultimately kind of the overarching design of, of the menu set, yeah. What prevents you from raising your rates as these establishments uh, build a business model that works and they turn a profit. Yeah, I mean, I think if you take a step back, you know, the success of Zool is predicated upon the success of our members. The last thing we ever want to do is, is hemorrhage their P&L from any capacity. Um, so it inherently, I don't think would be in our best interest to raise our rates, thus, make, thus making them less successful. You know, there was another third, for, third party app that said the same thing when they began. And it began at a very profitable partnership. It began at 10%. They infiltrated. They became a part of their existing model. They took over their model. And today, that same client that they helped build is paying 33% for the very existing third-party app. That's scary. As you learn more about me and integrate more about my business and become a part of it, that you can take it over by charging me a fee of your choosing. Because the understanding, I think it's obvious today, without third party apps and these delivery systems that exist, it's instant death. With them, it's a slow death. So, so I think the response to that is. We agree, we recognize and acknowledge that a 30% fee is unsustainable for the restaurant operator in an aspect of the business that is growing the fastest. Um, hence the threshold of coming in at a 15% you know, objective of figuring out how to take more control of the margin back to the restaurant operator. Um, at the same time, since data has been a, a subject here, um, when we, as Corey referenced, are able to drive demand through our own technology, not only are we envisioning doing so um, with the better margin that's ever been achieved um, in, in the industry, which is really appelling to the operator, but it's also with our receptiveness of utilizing and sharing data and having the element of transparency that doesn't exist today for the restaurant operator with the way that the platforms are functioning at the moment. So all of those objectives that we're looking at incorporating into the solution set are part of, um, with the in, are, are fully with the intent of, of disrupting um, the way the model works today to ensure that the ensure the restaurant operator can take control back um, with that aspect of their business. Because you're already established in New York City, um, can you elaborate on some of the issues and hurdles that you are, had to overcome, whether through bureaucracy or regulations? And you heard the opening testimonies mm -hmm. of the um, Department of Health and the concerns we have and around the letter grades and how that system operates and how it impacts um, the shared kitchen scenarios. Uh, can you elaborate any on any of these topics? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, very similarly to, to opening up a brick and mortar restaurant, we had to go through the similar steps, you know, working with the Department of Building to ensure that our design and construction plans were um, in, in accordance to, to their their laws. You know, similarly, we worked very closely with the Department of Health, you know, as this was New York City's first ghost kitchen facility. How do we work together to figure out how to make sure that everyone's being held accountable from a sanitation standpoint? Um, to working very closely with Con Ed. As you can imagine, with nine kitchens, the gas and electrical load there is significantly different than what a typical restaurant sees. Um, and I think, you know, what Sean and I have really strived to do with our incredible team is position ourselves as New York City's ghost kitchen partner. 
um, and really the go-to. And I think if you were to, to take a, a peek under Zool's hood, you'll see that we've got an open book uh, transparency, you know, core value through and through. Um, we understand that this, you know, uh, industry is, is, uh, is, is incredibly new. Um, that said, as Jim said, you know, consumers are really dictating that this is the model of the future. I think the trends and the data certainly supports that. So we welcome, you know, uh, opportunities to connect with, with folks such as yourself to ensure that we are putting not only Zool's best foot forward, but our brands as well. Does Zool get a letter grade by the Department of Health? So we don't get a letter grade. We are actually a shared kitchen, which is uh, permitted as H26. That said, it is very similar to the grading system. Um, happy to announce that we only had two points docked uh, on our, our first uh, inspection. Um, that said, I'll just lead into probably your next question. Our, our brands do have letter grades that they very proudly display in their, their windows of their kitchens as they all have uh, obtained A's. Uh, at the earliest onset here. Um, and that's a, a part of, of us helping keep their facilities clean as well. You know, certainly the shared space um, within Zool. So when you heard the questions that I posed earlier to the Deputy Commissioner of Health, um, if, you, if you have or are responsible for the common area, whether it be dry storage or just a hallway leading to the connects the restaurants or the, uh, sm the small shared kitchens to the Refrigerator, refrigerators or shared or shared dry storage rooms. Who receives the violation currently? So that would fall on us. Great. And so, know that that does fall, it can fall down to, to the individual license, which obviously incentivizes us to make sure that we maintain an incredible uh, level of, of sanitation. In our I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So if there was mouse droppings found in a commercial, in your shared corridor, that violation would be issued to Zoo. Correct. And that would have no impact on the kitchens that operate within the facility. As it stands today, correct. You see the difference between our traditional brick and mortar? If that was the scenario in a normal establishment, that would have an impact on that restaurant, which could be easily tracked uh, through the internet, you can see how many violations and establishments received, and if there is concerns, it'll impact their grade. And as you heard earlier, when it comes to uh, foods such as seafood, which we're very sensitive about, we want to make sure that they're operating at the highest standard possible because of cross-contamination and the health impacts. Do you see that there's a concern here? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's top of mind for us. You, know, you should see our, our binder that has our, our health cleaning standard operating procedures. Um, we run a, a very tight ship because we know that the, you know, the, the common, spirit, uh, common areas um, can have an impact on, on the brand's you know, overall sanitation as well. Right, but in this case it doesn't. In this case, the violation is issued to you, not to the actual independent kitchen. They're actually shielded from ever being impacted by it. And that same uh, protection is not afforded to traditional single owner occupied brick and mortar. I, I'm concerned as to how do we make sure that we're transparent and I'm sure you're operating, I've been at your locations and I'm, uh, I can attest that it was incredibly clean and organized. We have that on the yeah, that was the, but I haven't been back since then, so I don't know what happened last week. But <laughs> my concern is the double standard. And obviously if there was mouse droppings inside one of the four walls of this independent kitchen that you're, that's re renting space from you, that violation would go to them and not you. But if that mouse was running between two doors, Unless we can trace that there was mustard on the mouse's mustache to know which, where he dined or she dined, we have no way of actually issuing violations to those other kitchens. And the consumer may not be aware that they could be operating with a substandard grade. 
You heard about that one example? Sure. As a bistro with a C grade, operating a virtual restaurant with six other entities, mm -hmm. with no cross connection to the person placing the order, and selling something as sensitive as seafood. Do you, I guess in a few, we have to sit and look to figure out how to shape this moving forward so everyone understands that if you're gonna operate in a shared facility, there's gonna be a shared impact and responsibility on violations, whether they're the responsibility of the, the umbrella. There is a meaningful and, and I guess intent for transparency and better informed uh, our customers as to when they patronize an establishment. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that at this moment, but this is a work in progress. I, th I think we, we acknowledge you and hear you on that. I mean, we're at, there's, there's a paradigm shift in, in consumer eating habits. There's something monumental happening in the way restaurant operators are evolving. And I think um, what excites Corey and I is, and, and the reason we're here right now, is we're at the forefront of this in New York City and really look forward to collaborating together to figure out from an element of transparency, um, being able to, to recognize the fact, which we're incredibly proud of, as is our team, as are our brands, that all of them received A letter grades, um, that there is an element of transparency and, and collaboration to make sure that consumers are aware of the quality that's happening in our facility. Look, I, I, want, I, I get phone calls from my small businesses that are being crushed. Mm -hmm. Crushed by these violations that could be interpreted differently by an inspector, mm -hmm. where a day earlier an inspector found no problem or found the problem, suggested you create in this manner. Next inspector comes in and translates that code to mean something else mm -hmm. to give it another violation. And these fines are hefty; they're not sure. nickels and dimes. Now, again, what your business model is, is sounds great, and it's offering it's successful, obviously, because you're continuing to thrive and expand. But when I hear from one from the industry that we're literally being destroyed by the Department of Health, that they can walk in at any given time, shut down our kitchen at our busiest moment, whether it be lunch or dinner. And here's an, an advantage that your model is offering that shields those kitchens from without any consequence or potential damage. I'm, I'm concerned, as you, could, as you hear in my voice. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to do this. And I, as a piggyback, as I'm looking at, again, understand that we shape things together. Do you, do you see a future where food prep is going to be automated as you strive to lower the cost um, of operation and come up with more efficient ways do you foresee this day or strive to automate a delivery service or uh, using drones as uh, <laughs> we're now thinking of um, to um, robots that are going to flip burgers for you and um, cook the food to the perfect temperature and degree and get rid of the need of uh, human skill? Yeah, you know, I certainly don't have a, a crystal ball here, but I do think that uh, uh, operators are always looking for efficiency gains. Um, I think it's something that we offer in, inside of our, our first facility um, by way of, you know, aggregating multiple brands under one roof. It allows us to, you know, share resources, if you will, um, in this in incredibly archaic and challenging industry. So, you know, to answer your questions, I, I, I don't have that, that crystal ball today, um, but know that, that folks are looking at how to make themselves more efficient. But you would strive to do this, to uh, help your clients uh, lower their costs, their operating costs. Robotics is not out of the question. Sure. I think there's an ecosystem that exists where we can uh, provide ancillary support to make our brands more successful. I think Mr. Perkins, you have a question?
it's not the twenty eighteen one. Um, I'm grateful to you, gentlemen, for being here today and bringing your expertise. We have quite a bit more um, to discuss, uh, and I'm grateful that you've kept your, uh, the lines of communication open as we start looking at the change that, um, or how we adapt to this change in consumer behavior and industry uh, to shape it where um, it's fair for all uh, and not undermining the, um, the models that currently exist that are so important to this city. Um, my door will always be open to you. This committee will always be open to you. Um, we'll fight for you as, uh, as a small business as well, and that's what you are with a different model. So if you have issues that you need to bring to our attention, whether it be Department of Health or Sanitation and uh, Department of Buildings, we're here to fight for you as well. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we're going to ask for Andreas Katasudis and Andrew Schneiper, please. And we're adding Jeff Banks um, as well. Uh, no particular order. Um, any of you gentlemen can start. Just introduce yourself and where you're from. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for your time. And I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And um, no, thank I'm you, grateful Catherine. to you. I find this actually very interesting. And uh, I commend you on, on digging into this topic so early in the game because I know you're also, there, there's a lot of discussion about third-party delivery platforms that, that you and the, the council is, is looking at. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say relate to it, but it's been around for a long time. And, 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 and I'm sure a lot of us wish we had looked at this 10 years ago. So, you know, I don't think any, any of us, or this, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I don't, I, I'm not against ghost kitchens. I think there's, I'm sorry, I'm Andrew Schnipper, my apologies. Uh, Schnipper Restaurants here in New York City. Um, just a real brief overview and then I have a few few comments to make is that I, I, I'm not against ghost kitchens and as you said earlier about innovation and entrepreneurship, the market is certainly changing in certain ways and I do think that um, these businesses exist because it, the market is heading that way and, and, and regulation and, and, and impeding businesses from, from existing is certainly not something that I would ever advocate for. But I do think it's very, very important as a New Yorker, as a small business owner that we, all the stakeholders, whether it be small businesses, restaurants, the, the, the citizens of New York, employees, understand what's coming as this grows a bit and to what degree should it be looked at and are the regulated or rules set in motion. Um, I personally have owned and operated you know, restaurants in the delivery space for over 25 years. So I've, I've been heavily in the delivery space. It's not a small part of my business. It's been as much as 30, 40, even 50% of restaurants that I've owned uh, over many, many years. And, Maybe I, I was one of Seamless Web's first customers back in the late 90s, uh, so I'm very, very familiar with, with the space and, and, and what happens with it. Um, delivery has gone from an important, profitable part of, of business, not just for me, but I think for most of my peers, to a, a business area that is either not profitable or marginally profitable. And you, you just see it in the fees and the cost and, and whatnot. And what's been particularly difficult is the competition in the space has grown quite a bit, which makes sense. Customers are demanding, demanding more, 
but whereas there were some restaurants that never delivered before and now we're starting to do some delivery, it's, the pie is only so big. And I think one thing that's very important that hasn't been said here yet today is New York City is very different than the rest of the country. We've had delivery for a very, very long period of time. It's not new to us. One of the things that makes New York City interesting is that you can get pizza at two o'clock in the morning, and that's not new. That's gone. That's been my whole life, and you know, if, for many, many decades. So the, the business has, has been here for a while. When you talk about a tenfold increase in delivery business, a lot of that is because there's small towns in Iowa where it doesn't exist at all, and New York City has had that for, for quite a while. So, so I, I, you know, I think I think that one of the one of the big issues for us as an industry and for for me personally is is it relates to what's going on with the third party platforms and how deliveries become very not profitable and and where where I see Ghost Kitchens as an issue is it only extends that it's an extension of third party delivery third party uh, data control you know et cetera et cetera we we know in our restaurants that customers are uh, ordering our products and then being asked or being pinged by third-party platforms to order similar products from competitors that might pay a higher commission. Um, so, you know, I, I, there, there's a whole variety of, of, of issues with data and with the cost of fees. The, the other thing that, that I'm particularly concerned about is as there are more and more delivery players in the space, what will likely end up happening, it's already happened to some degree, and this is exactly how I get, get marketed to from the Grubhubs and DoorDashes and Postmates of the world, there, if you want to do more business, pay us more and you'll do more business. That's what ends up happening. So when you see these 30% things and you know fees or whatever it is, their, their argument is you don't have to pay quite that much, but do you want to do, you want to do business or you don't, don't you want to do business? The more players in this market, the more that that's likely going to happen. So you know, there's a real, a, real, a real concern that not only for our bottom line and profits, perhaps mm. at some point or another, like it does get passed on to the consumer. Um, Outside of that, I mean, I, you know, we, we've looked personally at, at third party, uh, at, at, doing, at doing something with a ghost kitchen. Uh, you know, our, our sense is that, as you commented earlier, that it just makes more sense for us to do it in, internally. Our restaurants rely upon delivery. If we wanted to do a new market, we might consider it. Um, but I actually think the million dollar number is correct. And just being in the delivery business, I know what it takes to do a million dollars in delivery. It's, it's, it's quite a bit. So, so just to close it out, um, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of, the of, of doing more regulation, mm -hmm. but... I just caution everyone that the repercussions uh, of widespread ghost kitchens are hard to probably see today, but once they're in place and it will change the landscape dramatically, I think there should be regulations on um, how they're registered so that customers know that there, there are ghost kitchens, how, they're, how they exist, um, and just last thing, getting back to the data, you know, something that we've all talked about in the restaurant community is, is the ownership of data really should belong to the restaurants. We feel, I feel very strongly about that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I'm Jeff Bank, uh, CEO of the a la carte restaurant group, Carmine's and Virgil's Restaurants, 30 years uh, here in Manhattan. Most of my comments, I'm going to turn in my prepared remarks. I want to probably have more questions than uh, comments now after listening to everybody else. And then hopefully we can try and find some uh, alignment here. I feel a lot of this is just a classic bait and switch. I don't think we're aligned at all with these ghost kitchens. I feel like this is the exact same playbook that's happened to us with every third party app and technology, whether it's from open table and reservations, seamless uh, in third party deliveries and so forth. These companies come in with the, you know, doing it again, you have cloud kitchens coming in with $400 million war chests from Saudi Arabia, literally by the guys from Uber that did this exact playbook. They come in, they're not aligned with us. They can get as much market share as they want because they're not running a profitable business. I've had 30 uh, years of profitability in the city and Seamless last quarter lost 25 million. Uber only lost 1 billion. So they're not worried about what they're losing. So these guys are gonna wind up building up their businesses on my back. And while they may have, think they have altruistic you know, ideas about their supporting Sarge's Deli and this and that, let's see if Sarge's Deli is really with them a year from now. Friends with the owners, I promise you they're not. Unless someone just heard this comment and now Sarge's Deli will keep their fees low. So some of my questions are right now is 40% of chains, 60% locals. Do the local restaurants play the same fees as the chains or the chains have a better deal? Okay, they probably do. Uh, from the health department, they're very excited about letter grades, you know, and letter grades fix everything, you know, completely aside, uh, I'm going off on. Love to see letter grades in the public schools if it's such a great system. Okay, it belongs there, it's phenomenal. I don't know why I don't see it in my kid's school. But I think uh, that's an easy answer. Yeah. It's an F. 
Yes, which is why I'll never be there. From the Small Business Administration giving me a nice lecture about it'll help me with my SEO and SEM. I do spend money on SEO, SEM. Probably most restaurants can't afford to. I can. Google Carmine's Delivery. I'll be number nine after I'm buried by Seamless, Grubhub, which is the same company. Yelp Eats, no wait, Seamless bought Yelp Eats and Grubhub, I'm sorry about that. Um, open Table, Easy Caterer, you won't find me. So what these guys are doing is taking my customer. They're not increasing my sales. My customers can't find me. I have customers for 30 years. If they want to order from me, they got to wade through 15 other programs, fake websites, phone calls, money that still hasn't been returned to me. You've seen this game a thousand times. So I don't think we should fall so quickly for all these cloud kitchens are meeting you know, so well to help us build our brands. They will build up the brands, and then they'll double our fees. And then there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, it's just where I am. I think it's not anything that I'm telling you that you don't know, because we've all seen this happen already three or four times. It's going to happen again. Little mom pops are going to get steamrolled. I'll wind up being fine. My business will do well in one of these places, this and that. And then all of a sudden, someone will say, oh, why don't we just run a Carmela's Italian restaurant? And then my customers will be moving a little fast and won't really realize it. So I don't see them as partners. I think if they were partners, they'd still be here today, you know, and they'd be talking with us and working hand in hand. I don't see it. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Andreas Koutsidakis. Um, I have a restaurant with my father, uh, which my father has run and, and been in the restaurant business his whole life. I'm actually a restaurant lawyer. So I'm going to give a few examples that have come up just in the last few weeks uh, in my dealings with different restaurant owners throughout the city, as well as in speaking with my father. Um, relaying a lot of the messages that have been uh, said by Andrew and Jeff, um, one of them is the bait and switch issue. Um, that's exactly what happens. It's also uh, the data issue that you identified, which is a big problem. So the first example is Grubhub contacts uh, a restaurant and says, hey, you're a diner. Uh, people don't order pastas from diners, but a lot of people are buying pastas in your area. They're just buying them from Joe's Italian and Mike's Italian and so on and so forth. We're going to create your name, but a diner, but a pasta version. So Maria's Italian Pastas, you have a pasta section on your menu. We're just gonna change the names, change the descriptions, call it this and take away diner, put a new brand on there and it's gonna be an Italian restaurant now coming out of the same address. This is just, this, is, this happens every single day. And all of a sudden customers are ordering a lot of pastas from this diner that they never ordered pastas from. Same exact item, marked up prices because they're, they think they're buying a better product or a different product and they're doing it. Whether this is legal or not it, it is irrelevant. The point is that there's this flood of customers and uh, tying the two concepts of data and the bait and switch together here, it's not enough that they're coming in to innovate and create a new way to connect buyers and sellers, customers and restaurants. It's not enough for them, the actual locations. Now they want to create more locations within the restaurants so that they can get more commissions and more and more and more, um, which is happening as a result of the data that they have. They might very well be taking the data from the Italian restaurants in the surrounding neighborhoods. That's exactly where they're getting it from and saying, People are buying these pastas. X, restaurant X, Y, and Z are priced between 15 to 20. So we're gonna put Maria's Italian at 14. You're at 10, we're gonna mark it up at 14. You're gonna be better priced than everybody else. We're gonna know exactly when to put it up there and when to put you up because this customer always orders Italian on a Thursday. So these are the things that you're literally manipulating our community's minds, creating a ridiculously unfair competitive scenario in the market that can only be controlled with a tremendous, tremendous wallet. Um, one that even the most successful restaurant will never have. The business is just not designed for venture capital uh, money. That's, that's monopoly money. It's not earned blood, sweat, and tears money. Um, the second example is, uh, again, to reiterate the point that Jeff said, which is their partners, a lot of these founders, particularly the group that was here before, it sounds like they're, they're coming with good intentions. Business does well, they have good ideas. But the problem is when you're backed by hundreds of millions of dollars, eventually you gotta make sure that money gets back with a certain multiple so that they can sell it to the Grubhub or whoever else they're gonna sell it to and cash out. So even if intentions are genuine now, and, and they very well might be, in fact, I believe they are, um, especially the gentleman who said his family had an IHOP and they lost everything in the restaurant business. It's a great story, I believe him if that's true, that he's coming from a good place, but that doesn't mean that at some point someone else who put in $100 million into the company is not going to force direction one way or another to make sure that 100 becomes $1 billion. Um, so an example uh, that I encountered last week, which was 
unbelievable is a restaurant called me, a restaurant client called me, and he said, I want you to send a cease and desist letter to Restaurant X. I knew both restaurants, actually, through family friends, neighboring competing restaurants. The neighboring restaurant that he was complaining of had created, literally on the spot, created a new restaurant within his restaurant, named it clearly my client's name under his restaurant's, uh, under the, other, the competitor's address. He called Grubhub and said, what's going on? This, this is mine. I'm a customer of Grubhub. I have four locations. This guy is not, he's not that. He's unrelated to me. I want it shut down. You have to go through lawyers. We can't control that. I'm sorry, we can't help you. So not only is this literally with the switch of a button, someone can create a competitor's business as their own ghost kitchen in their own restaurant for horrible reasons, right? But, the, but Grubhub or whoever it is, is not even able to help you. You're left, go figure it out on your own. So again, that's just another example of very, very, very dangerous territory um, that most people can't, can't deal with. I want to thank you and have some questions for you, but I just want to uh, help tell, show the difference between virtual kitchens mm -hmm. and ghost kitchens. Yep. Or shared kitchens. Uh, like sure. Kitchen centers, and there's so many different Yeah, the things. common areas, as you described them, have their own problems, and I think the health inspection one is one of the biggest ones. Right. Yeah. Also, going back to the virtual kitchen of what you just described, where one restaurant with that is known and a database of agencies and departments and registered can operate a list of other names and no one would even know. Correct. Uh, I, and in essence, hijacking a competitor's business. Mm -hmm. And you, we, I just want to, I'll ask a question sure. but, and then we'll go back and forth on this. This industry is completely different than the other industries where we've seen technology really change. So, uh, Uber, we know the impact that it had on the yellow medallions, but the yellow medallions were all coalesced together. There was per, TLC represented them, the needs, and there was a different type of scenario. Uh, Airbnb versus hotel chains. Technology and the software, consumer behavior demands changed the model, but the big chains came together and are able to push back through advertising, better informing, and offering discounted rates if you come directly to us. Travel velocity, right? With airlines, the airlines coalesced, they came back and pushed back. In this field, in this industry of food service, you have uh, 27,000 independently owned restaurants. You can never agree on anything. There's no one that represents you wholly or that you can, can coalesce around. So it's easy pickings. I get it. Right. There is no umbrella organization that currently exists that will help push back. And technology is going to change our way of life, right? We know this. Internet is going, has infiltrated our business models. Um, We'll look at toll, toll booth workers. When was the last time you saw a toll booth operator? It's gone. Sure. The, that workforce is no longer needed. So these are my concerns in not stopping change, though. Correct. The advancements are going to continue. We just need to make sure that we shape them where we can all uh, benefit from it. And your businesses, and the question I'm going to ask you, you, I have very little knowledge going back to my pizzeria days. How is it possible for you to have a separate kitchen at a separate facility paying 15% of your total sales price plus the additional labor, profitable? Plus rent for the space. Right. So there's a couple of things that are going on. One, I agree with you about, you know, technology is different, maybe being disruptive in other industries in this industry. In this industry, something you can go back to is the health and safety factor. If you go back 20 years or 15 years before all these apps and this and that, and you ordered delivery from my restaurant, everyone who worked for me, I'd have people on the premise who had been trained through the health department, we had safety inspectors, and everyone in the business was beholden to me. Now, when you order from these third-party apps and a complete stranger picks up the order, does that person have any food safety handling certificates? 
What is the responsibility of that person? So if the person, if the guest gets sick at the end of the day and then complains and sues the restaurant, you, without even reading it, could probably tell me the answer to this question. What do you, who do you think has the liability when I signed that contract of adhesion that I had no choice to sign and that was shoved down my throat? Who's probably liable for the, for the health and safety? Me or the third party kid who works with 12 different companies and took the delivery? So there's a health safety factor that has to be looked into this, one for sure. Help me, because we want to stay focused on the ghost kitchen, yep. uh, virtual kitchen uh, environment, and not sure. so much in the third party apps. We had a hearing on that already. But they it's part of these ghost kitchens, because if you're, okay. if you're working there only paying 15% and you're leasing your rent, who's delivering for you? But you're, I'm sorry, but, yeah. but you're not only paying 15%. It's one of the pieces that, that was missed. You pay 15% if they can get customers to order through their app, but the reality of the matter is, the other third-party apps are much larger. So you're, if you're operating in a ghost kitchen, I can guarantee you, without a shadow of a doubt, your largest deliverer of orders to your restaurant will still be Seamless, Grubhub, DoorDash, or Postmates. It's not gonna Great be their app. So you're at 30%. Your small, small piece is 15%. So, so you're, you're, you just brought something to light that I didn't mention earlier. Uh, under the shared kitchen scenarios, the virtual kitchens or ghost kitchens, where they're paying 15% to those, at, whether it be Zool or whatever the other entities are. In addition to that, an order can come in through a third-party app where you could be paying up to 33% plus the 15%. Uh, on top of that, you are now at a, based on the numbers we know, at a loss of 60%. You're paying rent, you're paying labor, and you do have a brand that you're supporting out of your other brick and mortar restaurant. You're not just opening up in this place out of nowhere selling sandwiches. So as much as Sarge's may be downtown in Zulu, they still have to attribute some of the goodwill back to the original restaurant, the cost and overhead over there. This model doesn't flush out, and the problem is there's a lot of collateral damage during all this, but the companies don't worry because of the 400 million. Do any million. of you have any evidence that the Third-party food apps are working with uh, these shared kitchens, ghost kitchens. I'm sure they're. And, and they're DoorDash, sure they, try to. DoorDash a, they have built, an agreement, not just but, through. But, but DoorDash built their own um, ghost kitchen in California, so and then put in put in their own um, and put in put in concepts, and they own the actual ghost kitchen. So maybe not here yet. And, it's, and it's, there's it's, only one concept here at the moment, one one ghost kitchen, as as uh, Corey pointed out or Sean. But the reality is that it's it's already happening. The, are you, your current models, are you able to compete with ghost kitchens where they don't have a traditional brick and mortar or commercial corridor, you know, paying high retail space for um, the storefront uh, plus the lower cost? Are you guys able to compete with that type of No, market? because I'm trying to make a profit and they don't have to. So they can do whatever they need to do, throw at the internet, advertising, subway ads, whatever they need to do to get their business. Like I said, if you Google Carmine's delivery, forget whether I'm in the ghost kitchen or in the store, by the time you find me, you're going through, one of the, you're going through either the cloud kitchen and saying they deliver for Carmine's or this. I'm kneecapped and cut off. Can't afford to compete on that level, and I'm a bigger, I'm a bigger group, so I'd have no idea how an independent could you know, do that. It'd be impossible. But also getting to what Jeff said earlier about um, how the, their business model doesn't necessarily require profits, there's a lot of collateral damage, so can we compete? The, the, the question may be, how much business are they gonna take from us while they're losing money? So maybe one day they go away, maybe one day it consolidates and it gets worked out, but in the interim, while they're not operating in a traditional business environment where we, we all need to make money to keep our doors open, there is a lot of collateral damage. We're losing a lot of sales in the process. So there is a piece of, it's not a question of, comp of competing, it may be a question of how much share they're taking. Uh, I think I think really it just comes down to you know the same analogy, the same problems that you heard a few years back with the food carts that pay nothing, that didn't you know are renting a, a license of one vendor and you have 30 vendors copying the same license and all of a sudden you have this big problem. Where are they going to the bathroom? Where are they you know washing their hands? Where are they doing all these things at the same time that the letter grade was happening? So from a high level. You have, on the one hand, the city and the state, and everyone's complaining and worried, and oh my God, all these storefronts are empty. Um, and on the other hand, why? Why is it happening? And there's always a target. 
the target, the reason, the explanation of why is because look at the burdens of the actual traditional brick and mortar storefront business. I don't care if it's a nail salon, a restaurant, or anything else, versus the technology version who is in some random location, who is loopholed around health inspection, who does not have to worry about as many employees, does not have to worry about you know sexual harassment training and handbook policies and disclosures. The rules are stacked against the brick and mortar, and it's much more expensive to do business that way than the other way. Andres, help me. Going back to the relationship that you described before, where the, you knew both. Uh, the restaurants used restaurant. the competitor using the other one, the restaurant's name. Under the ghost kitchen, a virtual restaurant scenario, were the prices competitive or lower than his competitor? So that the example when my when my client was telling me about his conversation with Grubhub. The conversation was exactly what I said. I know what the customers in this area want. The only way they know what they want is because of the data they accumulate through Grubhub sales orders from presumably their own customers, other restaurants. What are people searching for? Where are they buying it from? At what price, right? You have all of these menu items. This is the price point that you're gonna be. We're gonna set you up, we're gonna do your brand, we're gonna create your menu, your description. You have to do nothing. The orders are gonna come through the same facts that you receive your other orders, your same printout machine, however it's gonna be coming, same POS, everything is the same. Actually, I think they gave them a separate POS for that business, so they had a little smaller uh, iPad for it. Uh, but that's it, and so they knew exactly what to do, and it was on, off, switch. Right, so that, that's the danger of this. It's just market manipulation. Pricing was the pricing was compatible to his competition. It was, it was higher. It was not, you know, a uh, twelve ninety nine, uh, you know, spaghetti meatballs at a diner. It was, you know, eighteen ninety nine. I don't know the specifics, but the the more important. I'm worried than, about the opposite. More, more that I get your data and I go to Carmine's and I'm going to open up now a virtual kitchen that mirrors Carmine's, well known, yep. famous. Well, the example is Carmine's was the customer they were taking business from, okay. in my example. That's a little different. Now, yes, I find, and I'm just going to point out a scenario, that if I were to open up a virtual kitchen known as Carmine's to compete directly with Jeff, and now I offer the same products coming out of a other kitchen, similar to the yep. example that you just shared, but Carmine, now I lower my price. I now I've stolen your identity, your business model, yep. and now I'm able to offer the same products with the same logo name at a reduced price. What would happen to your business? Can't can't compete with that. Yeah. What's the and give me range? What's the profit on your uh, products? Across the board, average. Across the board, is food yeah. cost twenty five percent. You, you're twenty five percent. I'm, I'm selling just pasta. food. You're I'm just in pasta. food. Just the ingredients. If you want me to be all in, and my costs are good, sixty five percent. Say that again. Sixty five percent, ten percent rent, seventy five percent, fifty percent miscellaneous. That gets me to ninety percent. Then I get a snow day. I lose a point. You know, it's a, you're in a ten percent model. Eight to ten percent. Eight to ten percent. At business the end of the model. day. Yep. Perfect. Roughly the same for you, gentlemen. Even less in my father's, in the diner business, it's margins but are please really smaller. Please understand, how are you able to survive paying 15% if you're a shared kitchen scenario or as high as 33%? Their argument is they're giving me incremental sales, which, we know, we've which seen is the not true. Problem. That's where the problem comes in. So no, you can't survive on that model, which is why we're here today. The, the last four questions I have for you is, are they going to be forced to be transparent and disclose all the fees? So the local guys know what the chains are paying because they can't negotiate the same. So they really gonna be transparent with their fees. Who's gonna protect our trademarks because we can't fight these 800 pound gorillas? Are they gonna pull a WeWorks and drive up the real estate tax, you know, real estate around the whole city? Are they gonna pull an Amazon and pay no tax and transfer everything out to their Nevada headquarters for management fees and they're not gonna destroy the New York City tax base? Are all their employees gonna be 1099, you know? And not, it's, it's not a level playing field. It's just not. Sounds great, but it's not. So to answer your questions, that's why these hearings are so important. We get sure. to understand, ask our questions, hear from the public stakeholders, and they bring to our attention issues. And this is going to continue. Uh, and I'm grateful to you for, again, making the time to be here. Uh, we're going to stay in touch. Um, and as always, my door is open to you as we continue to figure out how to best protect 
all stakeholders. Very Thank good. you, gentlemen. We're thankful you have a flashlight on us. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Bookman, <laughs> Andrew Riggi, and Matthew Newberg. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Bookman. I am counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, that umbrella organization with about 2,000 establishments in the city of New York and the hospitality industry, and we would certainly like to cover everybody. Uh, I want to thank you once again for holding a hearing such as this. It is rare in government at any level where there is concern about the future, um, and we're always looking for current problems and the future comes and bites us, you know where. And I think the lack of future looking is what's caused this crisis that we have with small business vacancies right now in our, in our neighborhoods because there was no future look at what's happening to the retail and what are we doing to small businesses that are making them so expensive to operate that nobody's taking over these, these spaces. So this is part of an important um, conversation. What keeps me up at night, and I jotted down some notes when I literally woke up in the middle of the night, was the following. A five-step program to turn individual and independent mom and pop restaurants into the next generation of independent bookstores, meaning they're gone. Step one, get everyone addicted to a home delivery virtual platform. Step two, once they're addicted, significantly raise the fees to restaurants so they can continue on that platform. Step three, move existing restaurant customers to their platform by making it difficult to find their restaurant that they've always ordered from anyway and order directly from them, charge them bogus fees for people calling them directly, and collecting fees that they shouldn't be entitled to in the first place because it's just my customer trying to call me, but it's they find their phone number instead, like Jeff just said. Step four, spend millions of dollars in advertising directed at consumers with the message, why eat out, just get delivery. And step five, open their own virtual kitchens where they own the names which only exist in, in the virtual universe and cut out the need for local restaurants completely. That's what I worry about, and that's when your independent restaurant in the neighborhoods uh, outside of, you know, Times Square, you know, where you have 60 million tourists coming a year, uh, will become the next generation of independent bookstores. They'll be gone. These multi-billion dollar companies are not here to expand our business. They're here to ultimately become the business. They don't need us in their long-term plans. They want to own the food, they want to own the delivery, they want to own the, the, uh, the spaces uh, and the names, and why bother, quote, partnering with a restaurant? So that's what keeps me up at night, and I know it does you as well, and we need to find solutions for that. Now, I, I just, Robert, I, and I hear your concerns, and I would just want to push back on one thing. Change is inevitable. Right. I mean, um, if we look back at the history, uh, at one point, uh, someone was making the best wheel or wagon ever. Cars came in, did away with the need for wheel wagons and wagons altogether. In your own home, I'm sure you can remember a time when mom or your grandparents would sew their own clothing. We no longer do that at home. It's much more convenient and efficient for us to purchase products. Change and evolution and demands. I'm not frightened by that. I embrace it. We just want to shape it, right? Of we don't course. want a hostile takeover and the use of data to the very data that we have give, you have given your partner to be used against you as the concern. Uh, or when they become a part of your business model and then raise your fees to a point where you can no longer stay in business. These are the things that concern us. Of course, 
those other examples ultimately resulted in more jobs and better paying jobs building cars than they did wagons uh, and a clothing industry and you know, et cetera. What we're seeing with these changes are a reduction in jar jobs, a reduction in good paying jobs. No need for waiters and waitresses making a good you know, middle class living working three shifts a week. That's Inflation is coming. Uh, sh short term gain, long term loss. The less people that are working, the less people can afford to buy services and products and food right. and whatnot. We and empty it. stores. Right. Lots of empty I stores. I want to circle back to a few sure. questions, so no particular order. Sure. Sure. Uh, my name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Uh, I represent about 2,000 businesses in the five boroughs. Um, and there's a lot said, so I'll do my best not to repeat. Uh, I've submitted testimony uh, for the record, but I do want to thank you, Mr. Chair. These are the conversations that need to be, happy, need to be happening proactively. You're right. Um, change happens. It's inevitable. And the pace of change is faster now than it has ever been uh, in the past. And it will only continue to accelerate. Um, I think what we're seeing here with ghost kitchens are there's pros for brick and mortar restaurants. And if not checked, there can be a lot of cons, um, with many of which were uh, listed here. I think one of the best ways when it comes to customer data and the potential damage to our traditional brick and mortar restaurants is something like Amazon Basics. You know, there's tons of merchants that sell products on Amazon. Amazon said, wow, batteries, you know, we're sell our merchants are selling a lot of batteries. So what do they do? They come out with their own battery line. Now they have, I don't even know, probably 10,000 plus Amazon basic products that were the most popular being sold on their site. Uh, so if you use that analogy to what we have with Ghost Kitchens, Ghost Kitchens will have many different restaurants within their venues. They will have a burger place, a pizzeria, a pasta place, um, the list goes on. They will then be able to collect that data and say, you know what? These tacos are selling really, really well. Sure, we could go to the restaurants and tell them this, like Andreas in the previous panel, and tell him, you know, why don't you start this virtual pasta restaurant? Um, but more likely, what could potentially happen as well is they say, why do we even have the restaurant as the middle business there? Let's just use all of this data and start our own virtual taco restaurant in there. And then what would be the next logical step, which we've seen in the Amazon and in other cases, is they will then open that virtual taco restaurant within the venue that would directly compete with the ghost kitchen that's tied to the brick and mortar business. And they'll say, hey, if you want to be listed higher in the search results, you need to pay us more. So you will get into this circular issue where they are able to a very sophisticated way using technology, not only be higher in the listings, but then use that data to say, you pay us a higher fee, we'll get you more sales. And if you want more sales, you're gonna keep paying more. So that's you know one example. So when we talk about potential ways to regulate, I think the ownership of customer data is vital. Now I understand this is a much larger issue when you're looking at Facebooks and everything, but I think that's something that could certainly be studied. There needs to be co-ownership to not just the data, but all the analytics that are actionable that are being used. Um, Two, fees. This is one of the ongoing issues. Most of the fees, the third parties, which I would say include ghost kitchens, and perhaps not yet, but certainly the direction they're going in, will be to charge additional fees. The problem is the end user, the consumer, never sees those fees because they're baked in to the cost of the product. So that one will mean the restaurants will increase their Pro, you know, their fees for their products, causing more, you know, being more expensive for the consumer, making New York City even more, um, you know, expensive for everyday New Yorkers to live. Uh, but it also means that people don't think that there is a cost to convenience, and there is a severe cost to convenience. So another regulatory measure could be allow the restaurant, the brick and mortar business, the option, not mandate, but per, may mandate that they have the option to pass on third party fees to the consumer. It's consumer transparency. The New York City Department of Consumer Affairs is into making sure consumers know what fees and charges 
uh, you know, are, are being charged. So those are, you know, two things that could do. You can also look at zoning. We've dealt with our nightlife establishment. Where you can dance it wasn't so much this cabaret law that was repealed. It was whether or not the business was located within a zone that met a proper use group. So if we want to talk about where these types of establishments can be located, zoning is certainly something that can be looked at as well. And I think the big 800-pound gorilla, you know, in, in the room is that that consolidation in the industry is that these companies are able to get some, so much market share and they're backed by so much finance where they have the ability to burn through cash to gain this market share that you'll see vertical integration so right now you have a uh, the ghost kitchen but nothing will stop them as we've heard from then purchasing or uh, you know, merging with a third party delivery site. So then they are not only the ghost kitchens, but they're also the site where you transact the orders. Once they have all this data, why wouldn't they then create a buying group? There's 10 different restaurants in here. We're going to start purchasing. Then they're going to get all of the data from all of those purchasing behaviors. And the company will benefit from that probably more so than the individual restaurants. Um, so the list goes on and on and on, but what will happen eventually is you will have a brick and mortar establishment by name, but the production, the labor as we've heard before, where the orders are transacted, how the food is purchased, how it is delivered from the ghost kitchen to the customer will all be owned by one major entity that is backed by billions of dollars and they can burn through this cash. So the small everyday restaurant basically doesn't own their business anymore. Andrew, I, we've spoken about this, and I'm grateful to both of you and all of you for <clears throat> the months and months, and if not years, that we've worked on small business mm -hmm. needs with you. Let's also remember that we are a free market society, mm -hmm. and we have to be very careful when we start looking at some big picture items mm -hmm. here. Uh, otherwise, we should all be selling pizza at the same price. No, a gallon of milk should be all the same price, and whatever products and services are offered, mm -hmm. there should be no competition. Competition is good. Unfair competition, where that, and we go back to some of the basics. Yes. These are concerns. So, although I am well aware and mm -hmm. agree with you on many of these issues, this is still the freest country in the world. Um, operate on free markets and not socialist views where we're going to dictate everything across the board. Yep. And I, I agree with you. I think, I think most of you heard in the prior panel as well, um, this is the way business works, but it goes down to what is fair. And currently, as you know, with small businesses, there are tons of laws and regulations. Right now, we talk about passing on charges. You know, currently, many restaurants would love nothing more than the opportunity to add a clearly disclosed surcharge to restaurant menu prices. They are not allowed to do that. Every other industry, even the restaurant industry outside of the five boroughs, is permitted to do that. Um, so, you know, again, it comes back to being fair. We don't want to do anything that's going to And that's by hamper. Local, local regulation prevents us here in New York City from doing we that. We don't want anything that's going to hamper um, innovation, but at the same time, customer data. You know, what is being put in agreements uh, is that a business, although it is really their data about their direct customers, um, it is being owned by a third party and has been put out, you know, you can't compete. So I think, again, it's just having fair and equitable access to the information. I think what, we just, we're going to apply. I think what we've been saying is we, we don't disagree with you. Uh, it's just that, as we see it on a national level as well, that these new large mega corporations that have developed are unregulated compared to the mom and pop businesses that have always existed. We're looking for more of a level playing field of regulation. So, uh, Matthew, uh, you just witnessed the two superheroes, Batman and Robin, how well they play together, and they are a great tag team, and you'd be a, a great uh, add-on to their conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Janai. <clears throat> My name is Matt Newberg. I've spent the last eight years living in New York, working as a product manager and entrepreneur in the technology field after graduating from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. 
Last summer, I released a 25-minute investigative online video that featured three delivery-only ghost kitchen providers in Los Angeles, interviewing restaurateurs from each of them to make better sense of this new trend. While this began as a side project, the response from this piece launched me on a new path to form Hungry, a new media platform that examines how technology shapes the way people eat. I have done extensive research into online food delivery and ghost kitchen providers, visiting different sites in LA, San Francisco, and New York, speaking with as many restaurateurs, real estate operators, and employees as possible. I'm here today to share my knowledge of the power that these kitchens hold and the potential impact that I foresee on our communities, workers, and small businesses. My conversations have led me to conclude that the goal of these startups is to build kitchen infrastructure, automation, and, lo and logistics that are optimized to deliver food at a lower price than dining in a restaurant or cooking at home, just like in China. Because they aggregate dozens of restaurant brands and convenience items under a single roof, large players like cloud kitchens can lever higher, higher average order values to subsidize the cost of delivery, making it free for the end consumer. Imagine ordering a burger, your significant other ordering sushi, and adding in a bottle of wine into a single delivery order. And because they are located in facilities that are optimized for the last mile of delivery rather than for foot traffic, all of this is delivered at breakneck speeds that we have yet to fully experience in this country. At a high level, as many people said, you can think of a ghost kitchen like a virtual food court that you might find at an airport where a very small number of companies are responsible for a wide variety of concepts. Today, these kitchens plug into third-party delivery marketplaces like Uber Eats, Seamless, Postmates, and DoorDash, but tomorrow, it could very easily exist on a single platform. It's quite analogous to Amazon, but instead of books, it's freshly prepared food that, pr freshly prepared food that we put into our bodies. This infrastructure is largely fueled by nearly $2 billion of foreign capital from the sovereign wealth funds of Saudi Arabia and Dubai for startups like Cloud Kitchens and Reef Technologies, respectively. On the surface, they are repurposing real estate like parking garages, warehouses, and strip malls for the on-demand economy. They have eliminated the front of house in exchange for designated delivery pickup areas and feature exterior signage designed to ensure that drivers, not diners, can locate the right facility. Thanks to a credit line provided by Goldman Sachs, Cloud Kitchens alone has the ability to turn its $700 million of equity capital into a $2.8 billion war chest at a minimum to purchase any property that can be conceivably subdivided into dozens of kitchens. As famous entrepreneur and early Uber investor Gary Vaynerchuk explained Cloud Kitchens to a room full of marketing executives last summer, it is unbelievable how much disruption is coming. The only thing that's going to be left is the brand, the affinity that the customer has for the brand, and that is it. It makes total sense that as fast, casual, and quick serve restaurants witness the majority of their sales shift from dine-in towards off-premise channels like drive-through, pickup, and delivery, that restaurateurs adapt to this very new world of convenience. But despite these kitchens' lower upfront costs, the significant fees charged by delivery marketplaces, the operating costs, still make it incredibly difficult for the average independent restaurateur to turn a profit. The recent study from Kitchen Fund, which you pointed out, an investor group that backs brands like Sweetgreen, Buy Chloe, and Inday, found that a ghost kitchen operator must generate at least $650,000 in annual sales from a ghost kitchen in order to break even. By comparison, the average Chipotle store generates just under 400,000 from both pickup and delivery. That's about 18% of average retail location sales. Both Cloud Kitchens and Kitchen United have experienced significant turnover from tenants since they both opened. The latter only has two of its original seven tenants remaining from its first location in Pasadena, California. Because many restaurateurs cannot stay afloat selling a single brand in a ghost kitchen, providers like Cloud Kitchens equip their tenants with custom-built software that makes it very easy to launch multiple concepts from each of their 225-square-foot kitchens. To illustrate this point, inside a single Cloud Kitchens 11,000-square-foot warehouse in West Adams, Los Angeles, there are 27 individual kitchens that are responsible for 115 restaurant listings on every single delivery platform at the time of my investigation. Re repeat that sentence one more time, a lot of numbers. <laughs> to illustrate this point, inside just one Cloud Kitchen's 11,000 square foot warehouse in West Adams, Los Angeles, there are 27 individual physical kitchens that are responsible for 115 unique 
virtual restaurant listings on every single delivery platform at the time of my investigation. Many of these are virtual concepts rather than physical restaurant brands, some of which aggregate items across multiple kitchens inside the warehouse, enabling that dinner date scenario I mentioned to you earlier. You won't discover them by walking down the street. If you want to see them firsthand, I suggest you Google site colon postmates.com space 1842 West Washington Boulevard. If successful, I fear that the diverse set of local restaurants around this very neighborhood, such as Sophie's Cuban Cuisine, Pasillo Italian Panini, Bombay's Indian Restaurant, and Leo's Bagels would be replaced with virtual concepts like Fry Me a River, Italian Stallion, WTF is a Quesarito, Late Night Munchies, Panini Gang, Try Tasty Tacos, and Morning After. I'm not making these up. There are 185,000 single unit full service restaurants in the United States, accounting for nearly a third of the total dining landscape by volume. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, independently owned restaurants employ just over 3 million workers. As restaurants shift towards an optimized off-premise ghost kitchen model, the need for front of house staff is eliminated. The number of back of house cooks is drastically reduced. Cashiers, hosts, and waiters account for 60% of this workforce. These jobs are replaced by apps in a ghost kitchen environment. Dishwashers become a shared service within the entire facility. Therefore, that num number trends towards zero. The remaining third of the back of house staff shrinks in half from five to two or three, leaving a total population of 500,000 cooks to find new work in ghost kitchens, about 17% of the current workforce. Those two to three workers could have, again, thanks to Cloud Kitchen's Silicon Valley operation that is working on building advanced conveyor systems. This could hypothetically evolve towards robotics. While ghost kitchens could create positive efficiencies like lowering carbon emissions through batch delivery orders or enabling restaurants to rapidly test new concepts, they simultaneously add another intermediate layer that makes it incredibly difficult to trace our food back to its original source. On a recent investigation, I discovered that a Rachel Ray virtual restaurant concept on Uber Eats was originating from Reef Technologies kitchen trailers in Chelsea and Long Island City parking lots, the latter of which was adjacent to a porta potty. These kitchens were recently shut down by the fire department due to their abundance of propane tanks that posed as a safety hazard. If there are any takeaways from my testimony today, it's the power of leverage that these kitchens have and their ability to shrink an entire city block into a single warehouse. One liquor license that can, has the potential to blanket an entire city. One location that equals 13 operators, 27 kitchens, 115 concepts. There are four Cloud Kitchen locations in New York already and more on the way. Two in Tribeca, one in Midtown, and another in Long Island City. By the end of this year, the 300-person-plus company will have a presence on every single continent in the world. It is my hope to, that today's discussion will inform future action that allows us to innovate while ensuring the future health and diversity of our modern workers, small businesses, and communities. Thank you. Matthew, you are very sobering, I can tell you that. Mm. Yeah. You've just predicted Armageddon and the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> um, the number that startles me the most, I guess, where do you see, uh, you've just pointed out ghost kitchens of the future, this is it, marketing, uh, electronic, no need for um, um, walking down a commercial corridor, stay at home or bring it to your place of business. Got it. Consumer behavior demands, changes, we adapt. The automation, is that your concern of the future, that we will no longer, once they built this concept and controlled the market share, uh, alleviating entire need for brick and mortar establishment, uh, that we now look to further cut costs uh, and go fully, fully robotic or automation, at that point, three million jobs, is that where you're headed with all of this? Yeah, I, mean, I think you touched on all, all the right points. I I mean, for me, it's personally as a New Yorker, it's, it comes down to perceived value of choice, but really having that all being provided by a very few handful of players. And we've seen that play out in the 
industrialized food system that we have today with you know factory farming and whatnot. So I, I see this following a very similar trend. So based on your scenario, I think we just solved the housing crisis for New York City because we're going to have plenty of empty retail space to convert <laughs> to housing, um, and uh, we'll address that issue. I'm with you. But between, and you all, you all have a purpose here, and you represented your industry and fight for your members, uh, bring to light many of the issues completely. Just want to make sure that be careful what we ask for the same principles can be applied to you. So whether it be under the same notion, ending, seeking to end franchising, um, um, which some small owners have complained about and want to do, it's a problem for us. We want to figure out how to work with the changes so that everyone can benefit. And I, I'm alarmed and concerned about the future of our retail establishments, in particular, in this case, restaurants. We see the impact. We see uh, major um, name brands closing down their establishment, keeping one flag store open and everything being done online. It has changed retail. We are facing those same challenges for restaurant establishments, food establishments, except that their the model is allowing for the identity and the business model that the data was received from to be used against that very same establishment. Is there anything besides the passing on of the fees that these third-party apps are charging? Is there? Um, uh, besides the zoning that you brought up and uh, the, the protection of the data that belongs to the actual uh, restaurant. Any policy Anything else, else that we can know. add that we should be reflecting on as how not to stop this, but help shape it where it's more fair and balanced? Yes. And now, let me direct first, uh, if you don't mind, to Matthew, and then I'll spring back to you. As Batman, on behalf of Robin, I want to, by the way, welcome Superman to the Justice League. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't. Sorry, your question was about what other, what else can we do? I, I don't really have those, you know, those exact answers. I do think sitting in this room today gave me a sense from what you were speaking about with the health ratings was a very good point about transparency. If can, you know, I think. We can have all this convenience as long as we know what the costs are and we can externalize those costs and someone is, is paying it. Um, I think that that's a, that's a if, if I know that this, this restaurant had a low health rating when I went to order it, right? Even if I just said which kitchen it came from. I'm, I, I know these tactics to look up all these kitchens and I'm pretty good at looking up public records. Um, and that's how most of this information came, came about today. But the average consumer is not gonna spend as much time as I'm gonna spend doing this homework, right? So the more that we can, we can educate the consumer about what it is they're being sold, um, I think it's, that's, that's kind of all you can really do. Um, I do want to point out aggregation theory. I do think, you know, everyone said Amazon, Airbnb, Netflix. I mean, that's effectively what's being done here today. Every, you know, these kitchens are being built. Um, the larger companies, the ones that raised hundreds of millions, not the ones that, that came to testify today. They're the ones that are really looking at, at the brick and mortar re retail. The, sorry, they're looking at the physical kitchen infrastructure as a mousetrap to aggregate the supply, in turn, get a crazier valuation for aggregating the, the supply side. Any solution that wasn't mentioned that you think we should be looking at? And we also need to educate small business owners who might be signing leases in these kitchens. If you look at the marketing materials for cloud kitchens, uh, they suggest that it, you know if you want to go and open up a restaurant that it's they they make it sound easy they make it sound like you only need thirty thousand dollars of equipment um, that's true but you you know you're going to sign a twelve month lease you could lose a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand maybe even more two hundred thousand dollars of your personal savings uh, going into one of these kitchens so I think outlining for those those restaurateurs and knowing what they're getting into uh, is another area. Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, I think part of even at the Department of Small Business Services, when they offer services on lease negotiation, as these um, you know kitchens continue to expand and grow, 
the larger sophisticated restaurant companies will have the resources to review all of these leases, but simple things like non-competes. I mean, if you're going to open up a bakery or a pizzeria, you may speak with your landlord and you want to guarantee in the lease that they're not going to rent the space right next door to another bakery or a pizzeria. So part of it can happen in the free market, but we need to empower particularly those small business owners, to ask the right questions and to insist that, you know, if I'm going to sign this lease because I'm bringing a value add to your ghost kitchen, that in turn, you need to give me something. And that happens outside of the legislative and regulatory process. So it's knowledge, which is power. Two things. I think we need a lot more. And we've started discussions on city legislation uh, demanding and requiring transparency at all levels of these transactions so that everybody is on a level playing field. Over the last year since I've been involved in this issue, I've literally spoken to a couple of hundred, uh, 20 somethings who live in the city and not one of them was aware that they thought all this was free and not one of them was aware that the local restaurant that they love is actually potentially gonna go out of business if they keep ordering from them rather than directly. So that's number one and number two, is a much more macro view from 30,000 feet, is we have to, as a city, have a plan that we put into, into effect that makes it easier for small business owners to do business in the city of New York. And, that, and we are about to release 20 ideas for 2020 as a, as a hospitality alliance, most of which are city ideas ranging from making it easier to get a sidewalk cafe approved quickly to real estate taxes to, to a variety of other issues and certainly not adding more fines and more labor mandates on us because if it's cheaper to do business, then they can compete better in this new environment. But when we're the only ones handling all of these issues and dealing with all these restrictions and they're not, that's not a level playing field. Robert, uh, do any of you have any clients or represent anyone that has a cloud kitchen, a um, virtual kitchen or a ghost kitchen? I think we have members that are operating in some of the um, cloud kitchens or ghost kitchens. Has anyone brought to your attention this, not only the 15% mm -hmm. fee that is paid on top of the mm -hmm. rent to the ghost kitchen, but potentially if that order comes from a third party food order app? Yes, well that's... Oh, sorry. That there's an additional 33, so now 33 on top of the 15, you are at, on a 6 to 11% profit margin. Now you're at below 60% loss. Correct. So if you're operating in the ghost kitchen currently, you're paying all of those fees, but most of your transactions may be going through Grubhub, for example. So you are paying their fees as well. So again, what's happening is we're getting more third parties into each step of our business that are each extracting a fee. And I think now, to the extent that we have any members, they're in the early steps of that five step where uh, the Sarge's, you know, deli that they were talking about, oh, it, you know, it's still the honeymoon where I'm now delivering to a part of Manhattan that I never delivered to yet. We haven't gotten to uh, step three and step four, you know, where, and step five is while well, they decide whether they need Sarge's at all. Which ultimately will lead to higher pricing, which means Correct. because it's a percentage based agree agreement they're still making more money into that. Which and I just want to clarify, I think there might be, may have been a misunderstanding about that 15%, and I'm not entirely sure about this, but it sounds like from Jim speaking that he was saying if the order comes from Kitchen United, they charge 15%, not on top of the existing fee. Well, they're paying 15% out the door. They're paying 15%. United and they're, at Zool. They're paying 15% if they originated the order for yeah. them. So they have ordering kiosks in the front of their house where you can actually walk up to Kitchen United and say, I want to order from this tenant. And they would charge 15% on that. But if it actually got sold on Uber Eats or Postmates, you'd be paying the, the effective rate on those particular platforms. So it's not 15 plus 33%. It's 15% or 33% or whatever the negotiated rate is for that particular tenant. But who's doing the delivery if it's the 15%. They're, they're not, those are for orders that you would walk into Kitchen United and, and sit down in their, no um, but they, they will do, their, their main invest, their new investor is RxR Realty. They're working with RxR to generate demand from other office properties where, I don't know who's, it's probably going to be someone like a Relay, which is a third party um, a fulfillment API that will basically 
you know, do the delivery on behalf of Kitchen United or Zool or whomever. Those guys actually used to work at Relay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Healy from Grubhub. Ms. Healy, I want to thank you for your patience, and I'm uh, so First. glad that you're here to be a part of this, uh, and I'm glad that you actually uh, were able to stay for the whole duration as we understand the moving parts, and I'm sure this is going to help in the uh, testimony you're about to give us as we help shed light on the industry and the business models and address some of the concerns uh, that were brought up. So thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm really grateful to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Joe and I, and um, members of the committee. Um, thank you for having me. Again, my name is Amy Healy. I'm Senior Director of Public Affairs for Grubhub. Um, Grubhub is a leading online mobile food ordering and delivery marketplace. We have the largest and most comprehensive network of restaurant partners in the U.S., as well as more than 22 million active diners. Um, I know several of the um, panelists who spoke before me um, we're concerned about competitors in this space um, that don't have to worry about making a profit. As most people know in this room, Grubhub is the only publicly traded um, third-party delivery company in our space, um, and we are the only profitable company in our space. So I want to make sure that that's out there um, and separates us from our competitors. I'm going to skip some of this testimony that you have since it's been a long day. Um, but I want to um, definitely point on a few things, and especially I know data analytics and, and um, data sharing is an important um, issue for you, Chairman. Um, but first of all, you know, Grubhub has been connecting restaurants and diners in New York since 1999. We employ nearly 400 people in Bryant Park. Our employees live, work, eat, and breathe in New York, and we've proudly driven billions of dollars in revenue to local restaurants and over a billion dollars in tips to our drivers. It's important also to point out that the products and services that Grubhub designs are meeting the changing needs of diners and consumers in the United States. So again, we are following demand um, and hopefully doing it, and we strive to do it better than our competitors. Grubhub does not own kitchen space, nor do we have any plans to do so. I want to be very clear about that nor do we own any virtual restaurants. We are in the business of connecting great restaurants with hungry diners, not real estate or restaurant operations. That said, we have partnered with restaurants and restaurant concepts to market them on Grubhub and to handle delivery logistics. The larger share of the virtual concepts that we see on our platform are from independent restaurants that choose to open a virtual restaurant from their existing brick and mortar location or to expand their customer base and capitalize on untapped demand in their market while driving more value from their fixed costs. For example, we've seen a brick and mortar sushi restaurant that also sets up a virtual restaurant specializing in poke bowls to use the same supply of tuna and salmon. As, as I mentioned earlier, data and, and, data and analytics are important tools for our restaurant partners. While complying with state and federal privacy laws and our own privacy policy, Grubhub shares data with restaurants about their business that is essential when they're thinking about virtual restaurants. We provide a data analytics dashboard to restaurants that includes daily and weekly sales, orders, and menu item performance metrics, as well as trends. In addition to this dashboard, our restaurant su success team works every day to evaluate the performance of the restaurants on our platform and to cre create customized plans to help our restaurant partners be successful. We regularly share data via email to restaurant partners with suggestions about what dishes and cuisines are trending in their area to consider if they wish to open a virtual restaurant concept. But the choice of whether to open a new concept is always in the hands of the restaurant. Grubhub has been committed to virtual concepts for the last five years which is an example of how we're focused on making a difference with innovation that provides real value to our small and medium restaurant partners and diners. 
virtual restaurants let our diner and restaurant owners offer more creative menus without the overhead of renting additional kitchen space. Here's a local example. We worked with an independent restaurant operator in Brooklyn to reach two delivery zones with their brick and mortar virtual restaurant combo. The owner had operated a brick and mortar Mexican grill in Bay Ridge for years. But recently, after the owner took over a pizzeria restaurant in Park Slope, he decided to use the new location as a virtual Mexican grill as well, adding another delivery zone without all the added overhead. We understand that with these new restaurant trends comes new policy and regulatory questions for local lawmakers and government agencies. And Grubhub applauds the committee for bringing together interested stakeholders at this hearing so we can all better understand the implication these trends have on our local business communities. Grubhub provides the same benefits to a shared kitchen or virtual restaurant available to our brick and mortar restaurant partners. We require the same contract for a virtual restaurant or shared kitchen restaurant as we do for brick and mortar restaurants. And every one of our business entities we partner with are required to comply with all local licensing rules and legal requirements as part of our agreement with them. Grubhub is proud of our ability to drive revenue, attract diners, and provide tools to our small and medium-sized business partners that have traditionally only been available to national brands and chains. We continue to strive to develop products and services to help our restaurant partners adapt to changing diner demand and a changing restaurant marketplace. Again, thank you, and I look forward to uh, answering any questions, and I will preface it with, today is my one-month anniversary at Grubhub, so I will do my best. Um, if I can't answer your questions, I'd be happy to take them back and respond at a later time. Well, congratulations, and again, I'm Thank grateful you. to you for being here, and I apologize that we left you for last, but understanding the hearing uh, focused solely on ghost kitchens and the virtual kitchens, this would be a great Absolutely. way to end this hearing, so sure. thank you for your patience. I know that we have another panel afterwards, uh, so you may want to stick around for that if, uh, if time permit allows you to do so. I can't help but begin the first question on something that in the hearing that we had some months ago, and maybe you can just um, help answer. Uh, are you, is Grubhub still willing to re-examine um, the, the new policy on the phone orders and perhaps increase uh, the number of refunds that should not have back to the restaurants uh, that should never have yielded in a charge? Um, uh, I can tell you that Grubhub continually looks at improving um, our, our phone orders, which comprise a, a very small fraction of our orders. Um, we, we'd be negligent not to continue to look at how we can make that service better. Well, great, because I'm really uh, stuck on this issue, and the more I hear back from those restaurants that uh, took it at face value that the charges that they were um, seeing on their uh, bills that were itemized were actual transactions that occurred. Uh, and for some of these small businesses, those fees over a duration of time were in the tens of thousands of dollars. I am going to be working with you to come up with a solution to those charges that should never have been incurred be refunded back to those small businesses. It would go a long way in them continue to keep their doors open. Uh, they're struggling, I'm sure you see it out there and uh, the numbers are real. Um, they come to me uh, regularly looking for updates. It would make the world of a difference with some of these very small, micro, mom and pop shop restaurants that five or $10,000 in questionable fees could determine whether or not they stay in business. No, and I, I would encourage you to make sure that we communicate on this, and if there's restaurants that are not getting the answer that they need from, from Grubhub that are going to you, then, then that's why I'm here. Great, so you heard some of, the, thank you for that. Uh, you heard some of the testimonies, and I didn't pick up on it until later, and obviously I got a different answer that perhaps on this, on a ghost kitchen or shared kitchen scenario, the percentage that they're paying that umbrella organization uh, could not be a double hit with a Grubhub. Is there an instance where Grubhub platform, um, where some of these uh, independent kitchens are using more than just the uh, Zools of the world, a uh, shared kitchen concept, but they're also using Grubhub and other third party online provide services? I'm not sure I understand your question. 
So you heard the model of shared kitchens. Yep. Where several kitchens are in one facility. Right. Uh, where they pay rent. And in addition, they pay a percentage to the um, the umbrella uh, right. of that Right, Cloud or Zool or whoever. Correct. Yep. Are those independent kitchens also working with other third-party provider so like Grubhub? We absolutely do deliver for restaurants that are contained in cloud or shared kitchens. Um, I don't know what percent of our business is that, but there are times where they contract with us to provide the delivery. So in addition, and you also offer the same packages of marketing. Um, right, so our commissions are based on a sliding scale depend on, depending on the needs of what the restaurant chooses to purchase from us. Right, and those fees we know could go as high as 33%, which includes delivery and credit card charges on top of that. And marketing services. Correct. Is there any scenario where they could be paying both? The 30, up to 33% fee to Grubhub, and then on top of that, a 15%? I, I, I don't know what a restaurant is paying to a, a different third-party provider. I, I don't personally know. I can see if I can find out, but... Um, so could there be a connection where I'm going to order through Grubhub, Grubhub to Zool or Cloud Kitchens to um, Reggie's Pizza? You, is there a connection between... Could there be a connection? Sure, there could be a connection, but I, I those fees, my understanding from listening to the previous, and I don't want to talk about their business because I, oh, no, I don't, just, I don't know it, but they're charging the restaurant that. They're not charging the diner. Correct. So if I went on to Grubhub's application looking for a restaurant, I purchase through your website, your software. Could that software now connect me to any of those other cloud kitchens and shared kitchens and virtual kitchens, where you now are going through a cloud kitchen, a zoo, or uh, any of those other kitchen centers? Grubhub does partner with restaurant concepts that are part of cloud kitchens. Right, so no, no, not the independent kitchen itself. The provider of the marketing service as well. Okay, that I, I, I'm not sure, and I can't, I can't answer you for you, but I can find out. But it, in your mind, the theory could exist. The theory could exist. But I, again, you know, one month in, I, I'd be, uh, it'd be irresponsible for me to make that claim. Yeah. We know this of our small businesses. They don't have the time. They're, you know, busy making the donuts, to, you know, uh, focusing on getting the orders out and their day-to-day uh, -day tasks. And we, we, as we know, through past experiences, they really are not afforded the time and the liberty to go back and look at statements at the end of the month. I would hate to see a scenario now, on, uh, and because of this hearing, that could potentially lead to a double commission that that small independent operator may not be aware of uh, using this uh, virtual kitchen, uh, shared kitchen concept where a percentage is being paid to the operator of the general facility, and then on top of that, because of a connection through the software platforms that exist through third-party apps, be hit by a second commission. Right. My understanding, listening again to the previous panelists, is there was a gentleman who might have misstated or overstated the amount of fees that were being charged. Um, so, I mean, we're all for transparency, Councilman. But that would... And just talking it over, that it could potentially happen. Um, I guess it could. Again, I, I'm not going to speak for the cloud business model. Yeah. We'll look into it, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more questions in around right. that scenario that just came up as of today's hearings. Do you support displaying uh, Department of Health grades on your applicant on your app for your clients? Um, I'd, I'd have to find out. I believe that issue's been talked about, and I know there's an issue with um, space on on the mobile app for how much you can technically put on there. Um, I know this issue's been talked about for years with Yelp um, and and other you know online directories that serve the restaurant vertical marketplace. Um, and I, I'm not sure where the city's landed out previously on that. 
Yeah, we're still working through it, but it's a single letter. I, I don't think it's going to take up much of uh, space on a, whether it be a phone or a computer. I know. Yeah. Try, try talking to the engineers about changing, changing things. It's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> I, 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 I can understand what you're saying. Um, so you, we're open to that discussion. The concern, especially in hearing today's testimonies, where you can have a kitchen operate a virtual kitchen and bypass the grading uh, that so many New Yorkers rely on to determine whether or not to patronize an establishment. You heard some of the examples, right. you know, where a restaurant uh, as a bistro is offering six other, uh, under six other entities serving a multitude of foods, including something as concerning as seafood. Um, the, the grade that we have, the system that currently exists, would be extremely beneficial to the end consumer when determining what location or establishment they're going to purchase from. That's the purpose of the question to you. Right. No, no, no. I, and I, as I think about this issue when I was preparing for this hearing, um, you know, as a public policy, profession, public policy professional, I, I see the, the, the new challenging landscape for restaurants that the city's going to continue to address. And, you know, we're happy to be part of that conversation. You know, again, Grubhub doesn't own the restaurants. We don't own the space. We don't own commissary kitchens. You know, we are a third party marketing and delivery and processing app. Thank you. So which leads us to the next question. Um, how do you inform consumers that they're ordering from a virtual restaurant? How would you perceive that? Um, I, I don't believe there's any difference um, when someone's ordering from a virtual restaurant, um, but I'd have to confirm that. Uh, are you concerned about these ghost kitchens and shared uh, kitchen centers and the impact that could have on your very industry based on what you've heard today, whereas um, I think that number was in one location, um, 100 plus restaurants uh, in name offering service products of multi of 27 restaurants offering 100 and over 100 options of specialty foods. Would that undermine your very existence as well if this became a new trend? Grubhub's there to serve you know, diners that want variety, complete list of restaurants, um, and convenience. So if, you know, we have to adapt too to the changing marketplace, um, you know, and I'm confident that, that we can do that. Um, so I wouldn't use the word concern. Are we paying attention to it? Absolutely. Um, are we trying to help our small business partners that are interested in virtual reality, excuse me, virtual restaurants um, with advice and data and tools? Absolutely. Um, so this, this is a new space for us, and it's one we've chosen not to get into on the level that some of our competitors that you've mentioned and, and others have mentioned today. And the, and the numbers are uh, in one facility of 11,000 square feet, 27 kitchens offering 115 restaurant entities. That's, that's, that's challenging. That would take over in a, a whole market in a rural area. I would imagine as they market and brand themselves, that would also impact you and other third party uh, food order apps across the board if they can control that type of a footprint. Right, well, I mean, we do really well in, in smaller towns. Um, you know, our business relies on a healthy, thriving SMB restaurant space, no doubt about it. The vast majority of our customers, our restaurants, are small businesses, um, a, a very small percentage are your large national chains. Um, and when it comes to data, as you heard so often uh, come up, and as small uh, businesses, and particularly these mom and pop shops that may not have realized the importance of data um, and how relevant it was to their very existence, their concerns are obvious that that data that was obtained through their establishments, I mean, they've created the food, they've created the market, they've right. created the concepts, they've um, built a reputation in and around the specific food to find an app that, uh, such as yours, uh, that comes in offering a new marketplace. Can now, not only are you paying up to 33%, depending on the services that you're giving them, 
but that that data could perhaps be used against their business model and uh, be given to another competitor. And I know that you said you don't open kitchens, that you're not opening up other restaurants, you're not getting into that business. But as you help an existing client understand how to better succeed uh, and improve their bottom lines, you were actually, that's based on data that you may have obtained from a competitor. So going back to a simple scenario, if you've got, I'm sure you have a multiple number of pizzerias that are using Grubhub services. Based on the information and the markup and the uh, profit of garlic knots at one location, do you sit down with that other client and say, hey, if you want to, we're going to help you increase sales. We're going to help you show how to make more money on something that's going to be as simple as putting garlic knots on your menu, where the rate of return is going to be tremendous. Is that viable under your existing? Uh, I'm not familiar enough with our sales and marketing team to understand how they're using the competitive intelligence in that way. I do know um, that if we see that there's you know, a, a, a dearth of a certain type of food in an area, we might communicate to our restaurant partners and say, there's, you know, there's a need here that's not being met. And if that's an opportunity for them, absolutely we'll help them. Our job is to help them uh, take advantage of opportunities in the marketplace to drive and grow their business. And that's the concern. So yes, maybe there's a restaurant or a concept that exists outside of the delivery radius and you, the, the, the amount of time it actually takes to deliver that food to that specific location. Well, by giving that information to another client, will probably yield in a loss of sales to the business that that data. Like I said, treatment. Councilman, I, I'm not sure that the, the situation you're describing is how we operate at Grubhub. So, I'm, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on that. I'm good. I, we're just looking at scenarios, and so yeah. we understand. It is a very complicated. Scenarios. These are very complicated industries. Right. The, the, the business of data and how you use it and provide it to your customers, not just in our business, but in every business. You've said the challenges of technology today, and so much of that is due to the type of data, right? The comparison of Amazon and how Amazon knew that people were ordering certain products, so they decided to come up and, made, you know, brand their own products. Um, certainly, data is a very valuable thing for our small businesses. And some of the products we've launched for them have only been available to the national chains before. Um, the way that we're able to provide an analytics dashboard for a mom and pop, that type of thing was only available to national brands. We just launched a point of sale dedicated to, to small businesses, a point of sale kiosk. Those types of services were only available to your Paneras and things like that. So we absolutely will use data analytics and technology to help mom and pops that have been left out of, of that wave. And that's something that we're really proud of. Thank you. My last question for you, have we come up with any data that, that shows um, your platform is increasing sales uh, to those restaurants based on the concerns of profit, six to 11%, if they're paying as high as 33% with delivery and credit card charges, um, that it is sustainable? meaning that you're bringing that, you're offering um, the sales approaches that we're going to bring more customers to your location. The data I've seen all along has shown that this is a cannibalization of existing customers, that there is no real customer base that's so impactful that warrants those fees being paid because of the increase in business sales. I haven't seen anything thus far that substantiates the uh, thought that we're bringing new customers to you that warrant these high fees. I'm, I'm happy we're a public company. You know, our, our, our books are open and um, our, our CEO just issued a big shareholder letter yesterday. Earnings came out yesterday. So, you know, I can go and find out. Again, we support transparency, okay. um, but the bottom line is, you know, our customers renew with us because we're helping drive their business and they tell us so. Um, you know, we believe that they're, um, nobody knows their business better than they do. And they choose to use third party partners, whether vendors on all levels, because they believe it's good for them. You know, if, if we're not a good partner, they can walk away. 
Well, I, I think they also realize that without uh, an online presence, they're not able to stay open. Um, but the fees and the commissions that they're paying, as you may have heard, and we get a slew of um, uh, restaurants, uh, and whether through their partners or umbrella uh, associations, show us that each sale is a net loss. And there's not just one particular third party app, there's across the board based on the percentages that they come back and they now say without, we know that without an online presence, we are certain to fail. With an online presence under these third party apps, it's a slow death. So are, are those payment. orders that are um, just online orders or delivery too? Because Grubhub's, unlike our competitors, the vast majority of our orders um, through the app are online or delivered by the restaurant themselves. I, I believe it was a mixture of both. Mixture of both. Yeah. Which we'll stay in touch. I just. So, I mean, it, it's, a com it's a complicated industry, right? I don't think there's, there's no easy answers, which is why we're going to continue to have these conversations. Just using basic math. If we know it's 6 to 11% profit, paying up to 33% in a fee has to yield in a net loss for that particular transaction. Can't yeah, see a profit there. But I mean, the, you know, you're, you're putting the numbers out. I, I haven't seen the numbers that you're seeing. We'll continue to work on this. Absolutely. Uh, again, I want to thank you uh, for your time and your patience, and uh, we'll continue to figure out how we're going to shape the future uh, of this industry and this marketplace together. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Next is Robert Gernano and Kathleen Riley. Okay, and Kathleen? Okay, Ms. Riley, we left you up for cleanup. After almost four hours of testimony, I'll do my best not to repeat anybody. Um, good afternoon. As you know, my name is Kathleen Riley. I'm the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. We're a trade association for New York City and state food and beverage. Um, we've been representing our members for over 80 years, and as has been discussed in this setting, the restaurant industry is one of the last strongholds for brick and mortar, and New York City is contending with a transformative impact of e-commerce and changing consumer behavior. We think it's very important to ensure the continued viability of the restaurant industry in New York City. Today, we're very appreciative that the council has taken the opportunity to discuss ghost kitchens and that you have taken the opportunity to listen to all this testimony and, and get this conversation started. They're growing in popularity around the country and in New York City. And we really appreciate you being on the, having your finger on the pulse of this as an emerging trend and getting a stakeholder insight. In a ghost kitchen, as we have all established, it's a commercial kitchen that's for delivery only. Some may be associated with existing storefronts and others may have their own independent concepts. From our perspective, ghost kitchens are reacting to the difficult business environment that has been created in New York City. As a business model, they allow for renting less expensive space, focusing solely on a kitchen footprint and eliminating customer-facing staff. In a city where rent and property tax pose a major burden, labor is ever more expensive, and regulations are consistently handed down from the city and state, our legislators have incentivized a business model like this. So for just to give a couple examples, if you don't have to have customer-facing space, you don't need to worry about your tables. How many tables do you have? Do you need a public restroom? Um, you don't have to worry about commercial music licensing. You don't need to entertain anybody in there. You don't have to worry about the customer-facing posters to warn people about various different risks. You don't have to worry about, is your trash area intuitive enough that your customers will source separate their, their things properly when, after they've received them from you? You don't have a physical storefront, okay? Well, you don't have to worry about your signs and awnings and A-frames and following all of those rules correctly. You don't have to consider potentially, do I want to expand to a sidewalk cafe and jump through all of those hoops? 
You don't have to worry about if your building edifice requires scaffolding on it, is your sales going to plummet because now you're not visible anymore? You don't have a storefront, you don't have to worry about it. The point is that with that in mind, our stance on ghost kitchens themselves is simply that they need to be held to the same regulatory and inspection standards as restaurant counterparts to ensure a level playing field. And there's been a lot of suggestions that people have given about different specific ways that a level playing field can be accomplished. I think the point that you mentioned around um, lack of visibility for grading, health department grading, when you're ordering online, honestly, from ghost kitchens or not, when you're ordering online, you don't have the same visibility as you would if you were going somewhere in person. And as uh, I think Matthew mentioned, almost no one is going to take the time to go to the Department of Health website and look up the grading if, to a place they've never been to before just for the sake of due diligence. It's, people aren't going to do that. So we're looking to see a level playing field. We don't necessarily take specific issue with ghost kitchens existing because as you've mentioned, it's a free market economy. People are reacting to the realities of the business landscape. Uh, functionally, ghost kitchens are basically one step away from a business that serves food from a takeout counter. Just no counter, otherwise more or less the same idea. More importantly, we see ghost kitchens as a symptom of a very difficult business environment in New York City, and they're part of a trend. The trend is towards quick service, delivery-oriented businesses, takeout-oriented businesses, the idea that you want to minimize floor space and staffing and, your, and maximize your efficiency so that you can try to stay afloat in New York City. So the question that we want to leave, I would say you all, you council member with today, is what do we imagine for the future of dining in New York City? Our city has been a proud culinary capital of the world, and as a voice for the restaurant industry, and we hope everyone in attendance would agree with us, we believe in the importance of brick and mortar restaurants as a, as a place to share food and traditions and culture with both New Yorkers and visitors from near and far. We also know for a fact, of course, that the restaurant industry employs hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. So if 10 years from now, the dining landscape is dominated by takeout and delivery options with only a few true full service experiences left, is that an outcome that we're proud of? And if not, what are we prepared to do to protect and preserve the viability of restaurants in the city? So just sort of to wrap up, we are so appreciative that you've started this conversation. We look forward to being part of the discussion as it develops. As any new questions about the role of ghost kitchens arise, we want to be part of the conversation. And we urge the council, this committee, to continue to remember the importance of restaurants in the future of New York City dining and to encourage legislators to consider various means of supporting these businesses. Thank you for the conversation, and um, I have enjoyed listening to what everyone had to say this afternoon. Kathleen, I want to thank you uh, for your input today and uh, throughout the year. Um, the industry that you represent, um, you've been a strong advocate for them, and you've and together, I hope they realize how we've made things better for them and we're not done yet. So I want to thank you again. The door is always open. And unless there's someone else here that's going to uh, testify today, I think uh, this is the time that we close the hearing. Thank you so much for being here.